Good morning, and welcome to this hearing of the, of the Committee on Governmental Operation. It is a privilege to be with you this morning in my new role as chair of this committee. I look forward to working with my colleagues on this committee to make New York City government work well for all New Yorkers. And just want to acknowledge we've been also uh, joined by Councilmember Yeager. Uh, today's hearing is on proposed intro number 241A, which was introduced by public advocate Tish James and Manhattan Borough President Gil Brewer. Thank you both for your leadership on this issue, creating a Charter Revision Commission, and for being here today. Before we hear from the sponsors of this legislation, let me briefly explain why I support it. Nearly 30 years ago, New Yorkers voted to approve a proposal by a Charter Revision Commission to abolish the Board of Estimate and establish our city's system of government in its current form. Since then, the city has not closely examined how the system established in 1989 has functioned. For example, no panel has examined whether the budget process created by the 1989 commission has resulted in transparency, transparency and vision during those commission hearings. There has not been a serious look at, at adding community engagement prior to the formal startup of the Euler process. These are just two of the important issues that a Charter Revision Commission could examine. To be clear, there has been Charter Revisions since 1989. There have actually been seven. In general, however, these commissions consider, consider a narrow set of issues rather than looking at the Charter as a whole. Notably, all of these commissions were my mayoral commissions, meaning that all of their members were appointed by the mayor. Many of these commissions were created for political reasons, such as bumping another question from the ballot. Many of these commissions have been rushed, often with only around three months to produce one or more questions for the ballot. More, most importantly, because of all these commissions were mayoral commissions, they have dealt with issues important to the mayor. What I mean by this is these commissions have not critically examined checks and balances and other structural issues with our system of government. Furthermore, these commissions have often recommended ballot questions on issues that could be handled through the legislative process, issues that did not require our Charter Revision Commission. I do not mean to imply that these commissions were meaningless, but taking a thoughtful look at, look at the structure of the city's government is overdue, and that is what this bill would allow for. If you take a look at the weaknesses I just highlighted, limited time to do its work, narrow and parochial issues that could be handled through legislative, legislatively by the council, an agenda that is driven by the mayor, you may notice that the Charter Revision Commission that Mayor de Blasio recently announced suffers from all these weaknesses. The mayor has a right to create his commission if he chooses to do so, but in my view, the commission will be created, uh, that will be created by intro number 241A is, far is a far better approach. The commission created by intro number 241A will be inclusive and independent and it will have a broad, broad focus. It would include appointees from the council, the borough president, the public advocate, the controllers, the mayor, giving in a diverse set of perspective. Nobody will have a majority of the appointments, so we will have independence. And it will be in power to examine a wide range of issues that have presented themselves since 1989. It will have also the time to do so properly with the ability to work for over a year to develop its proposal if necessary. It will be a charter revision for everyone. Let me say that again. It will be a charter revision for everyone. I want to take a moment to thank Robert Newman, David Sizer, Kayla Taylor, committee staff, Brad Reed, Lisa Bray Cronk, and Zach Harris for the diligent work in this committee and getting us all ready. And with that, let me um, uh, also uh, just share that we've been joined uh, by Councilmember Powers and 
So thank you for being to here today, and I look forward to hearing from public, uh, the public advocate and borough Br president uh, Brewer, as well as good government groups, civic organizations, and others who are interested in the governance of our city. And with that, I'm going to wel uh, welcome my former colleagues, and now public advocate and borough president uh, of, of Manhattan, uh, to come forward and to testify. I want to thank um, Chair Cabrera, I want to thank his staff, I want to thank uh, Council Members Yeager Powers and Ampre Samuels, and of course I want to thank uh, my partner, uh, Borough President Brewer, for her tireless commitment for, uh, to pushing this issue forward, and the Speaker, Speaker Corey Johnson, for his leadership <clears throat> that he's shown for championing this legislation as well as his political political courage. <clears throat> the history of the New York City Charter dates back more than 300 years when it was first adopted as a colonial charter. It's important that everyone understand that this really is a lesson, lesson in civics. The charter is our constitution and it is a living document that must grow and change as our city grows and changes. Charters should be instruments of democracy, reflecting uh, the whole city as it actually exists. And unfortunately, charter revision has been used cynically in the recent past <clears throat> to block the building of a stadium on the west side, to keep a political rival from politically ascending to become mayor, to stop a grassroots referendum that would have limited the size of public school classes. Recent commissions under the prior two administrations have been created by mayoral decree and given expli explicit marching orders about the issues to consider and the conclusions to reach. The state law requirement that commissions consider the entire charter has been treated as pro forma and essentially ignored. Commissions have often been given an extremely limited time frame to complete their work, sometimes as little as three months. They have repeatedly taken up issues that could have been pushed through the regular legislative process by this body. And so under our legislation that has been co-sponsored uh, by the borough president and I, no one officially would have majority control. The commission's findings would not be predetermined, narrow, or rushed. In fact, the commission would be statutorily required to consider the entire charter. Hearings will be held in every borough at times that allow for full community participation. And I certainly have many areas of the charter that I would like to see changed and specific proposals I hope will be considered. Let me say at the outset um, that this commission will not be used as a vehicle to engage in an end run around term limits. That issue is off the table and will not be considered, period, full stop. In the process of reviewing the entire charter, the commission would naturally consider whether the council should have more say over the budget process is an issue obviously that I'm concerned about, whether communities will have more input in land use uh, deals uh, that are uh, all but finalized before they reach the community. That's something that I would like to focus on. Um, I want more um, democratization when it comes to land use and whether our current system of checks and balances are sufficient to ensure meaningful oversight of mayoral agencies. And last but not least, um, a consideration of the fair share doctrine, which unfortunately in our city is not fair at all. The people of this city deserve an independent commission that will not be directed to take a specific action, but charged um, with the responsibility to look at the whole picture and bring its recommendations to the people. They deserve a commission that is given the time to undertake a full review. They deserve a democratic and inclusive process that lives up to the progressive vision of true civic engagement. I support the substance of the mayor's proposals, particularly as it relates to public financing and uh, decreased campaign contribution limits, particularly in light of Citizens United. 
Um, but I do not believe that these two commissions exist in conflict. Our commission, which was proposed before the mayor's, is not a rebuke of his specific policy goals. The mayor's commission has a specific focus and a defined agenda, and that's fine. Our, attention, our intention is to create a commission that will consider the entire charter and put forth a set of proposals on whatever needs fixing um, in city government. The mayor's intention is to have his appointees put proposals forward for the 2018 elections. We need a longer, more deliberate, a more intentional process, creating proposals that would go before the voters until uh, 19, excuse me, 2019. And that is why I'm asking the mayor of the city of New York to join us and to lend his support. His commission can move forward and he can pursue the democracy agenda he envisions, but he, can, he could do it along um, with us. And meanwhile, his uh, four appointees can join our commission for an open discussion of what else our charter needs to do to grow and change along with the city. This does not need to be a zero sum game or even a competition. We can all join together to do what's best for the people of New York. I don't like competition. I believe, I believe in democracy and I believe in all of us working together for the betterment of the city of New York. And we need to put our game in, gamesmanship beside us and work together for the good of the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, and I too want to thank Speaker Johnson, Chair Cabrera, and the wonderful members of Government Operations Committee, my colleague, public advocate Tis James, and everyone who is here today to participate in this hearing on a local law, 241A, to create a truly independent Charter Revision Commission. I want to thank uh, Jim Karras, who is General Counsel, whom you all know in our office, and certainly on the City Council staff, Rob Newman, David Seitzer, and everyone who's part of this process. The law itself is pretty basic and self-explanatory, creating a commission of 15 members with appointments from the mayor, the speaker, the borough presidents, the public advocate, and the controller. That's how it should be, and that's what our situation and our law calls for. The council staff has done a great job with the committee report examining the history of charter revision in our city and in the current context. So I just want to explain the reasoning behind my push for this independent charter commission. I have been in government for 40 years, and I have tried to devote, devote myself to improving its functioning and its accountability to those it represents. In my years in the city council, I worked on government reform as chair of the technology committee and later as chair of the committee on governmental operations. In both roles, I sought to improve how government functions and increase New Yorkers' access to government information and services, same as you are doing, Mr. Chair. I watched as seven mayoral charter commissions came and went, and I testified at every single one of them. Most were spring, summer affairs and flings often beginning in March or April and ending in late August or early September. Even worse, a couple of them started in June or July and ended around Labor Day. Now everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but you cannot tell me that you can review the entire city charter, hear from all the many constituencies in our city, debate issues, and come up with a well thought out proposal in 40 or 50 days over the summer. And that doesn't even address the fact that most of them were convened not with the purpose of reviewing the entire charter as the public advocated indicated, but to fulfill a particular mayor's political agenda. In the case of the 2005 Charter Revision Commission, the New York Times reported that the mayor announced what would end up on the ballot before he even appointed the commission members. When the Seven Sons Commission undertook its work in 2010, I was sitting where you are sitting, Chair Cabrera, now. I work really hard with my council colleagues on proposals that we strongly believed could improve the functioning of city government. They were not attempts to grab power, address grievances, or gain political advantage, but many of them were proposals that are unlikely, unlikely to be put forward by a group of people appointed by any mayor. Just to give three examples. One recommendation was designed to prevent the mayor 
from using his revenue estimating power to thwart a council budget with which he disagreed, something Mayor Giuliani did in 1998. Another proposal would allow more public input prior to certification of a ULIP recommendation, again, something mentioned by the public advocate. A third would give the council an advice and consent role in the appointment of corporation council, and I think the city council knows something about this now. These were modest yet very important proposals to improve the fairness and responsiveness of certain aspects of city government. However, they were also proposals that appointees of a mayor are unlikely to put forward for obvious reasons. In fact, we were told that commission staff was interested in some of our budget proposals, specifically those designed to make the budget more programmatic as the 1980 time charter had intended the issue of units of appropriation, yet they nonetheless did not gain traction among the 15 appointees all of whom at that point were appointed by the then mayor. So, after the 1989 charter had been in effect for 25 years and no commission had attempted to address these kinds of issues that invariably arise when powers and functions are reorganized, I started working with our wonderful public advocate on this proposal, Letitia James. We felt that a commission that would be independent of any one elected official and that could make more than one election cycle to do its work would allow it to do what none of the mayor appointed commissions in the last 29 years have done. Really study how the charter has worked in light of almost three decades of experience and reach out to as many of our constituents as possible to get their input in all five boroughs. The legislation was first introduced last year, and I realized that the timing couldn't have been more perfect. In the last couple of years, I have recognized a marked increase in the New Yorkers' interest, and all New Yorkers, in the functioning of city government. In 2017, we had more than 1,000 applications for just 300 open community board slots in Manhattan, and in the past, we'd had 700, 500, 600. Many of our public ULRP hearings have been overflowing with residents. People are demanding more accountable government and more access to government. I truly believe then and now, this is the time for the independent commission we are proposing. Finally, I wanted to address the concern some have raised over allegedly dueling mayor and council charter commissions. The mayor certainly has the right to impanel a charter commission with an agenda to look at the important issues surrounding campaign finance and elections. And they are important issues, as the public advocate indicated. But a commission with such a focus that will place questions on the ballot in 2018 will not be dueling with a commission that has a broader mandate and will not put anything on the ballot until 2019. Moreover, from 1998 to 2005, we had seven, seven commissions in eight years. If the potential for two commissions in two years could be called dueling commissions, those commissions would have been a brawl. Yet they proposed changes to the charter each year, and the electorate did approve some and disapproved others, although I don't think there was much debate. But I do believe that the proposed independent commission would look favorably on many of the goals the mayor outlined for his commission. I think all of our ideas would benefit from the give and take and compromise that would be necessary in a commission not controlled by any one elected official. If an idea is worth pursuing and capable of being put into practice, its proponent should be able to convince others of this and achieve consensus among a majority of the commission that's the point of an independent commission. So I invite the mayor, as was stated again by the public advocate, to join with us so that we can all work together for the benefit of all New Yorkers. I must admit it is very hard for me to envision a commission, as the mayor has appointed, to convene and discuss in four months to have all 15 members appointed by one person and in fact, the staff is supposed to at least be reviewed by the 15 members, and in this particular case, the staff has been appointed already by the mayor. So again, I really want to thank the speaker and my colleagues on the council from the bottom of my heart. 
and all the elected officials from our city who have been so supportive of this effort, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I was re remiss in not thanking my staff and your staff as well, but in particular, I want to introduce to all of you Jason Furman, who is the Deputy Counsel in the Office of Public Advocate, who is responsible, obviously, for all of the work. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, both of you, uh, for sharing uh, today. I want to, uh, before I continue, I acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Samuels and uh, myself here today. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you both uh, for uh, coming out with this bill. The vast amount of years and experience that you bring forth, uh, the historical context. Uh, you were here when other commissions uh, were put together. You've seen some of the pitfalls. Can you give us a little bit more of the details regarding the pitfalls of previous commission and how we can make it better. Again, as was mentioned um, by our Manhattan Borough President and myself, and by the way, the experience between uh, the Borough President and myself, um, both of us are basically walking institutions, um, and so it's an honor and a privilege always to join with her on all issues related to civics and government as a whole. Let me just say that the pitfalls include the fact that um, each of the mayors, um, as was mentioned, have come forth with predetermined agendas. Uh, and basically what they want is a commission to rubber stamp uh, their views going forward. And I believe what's different about the commission that we uh, envision is a commission that uh, does not come with any preconditions, a uh, commission that does not come uh, with any um, uh, particular outcomes, proposed outcomes. We want to look at the whole of government. The Charter has not been reviewed for over 30 years, and I think it really needs to reflect what is happening on the ground and re reflect the city as we know it today and not as it was. And that's why it is so critically important that we have a commission uh, that will review all of um, city government. Now, do I have some issues that I would like for the um, commission to review? Yes. Does the Manhattan Borough President have her, has uh, some issues that she would like for the commission to review? Yes. But again, we're not putting them forth uh, before the commission. We're making recommendations. But again, um, from A to Z, uh, to the entire s soup of issues um, that is affecting our city uh, should be reviewed. And I particularly, again, want to focus on land use. As I travel all throughout the city of New York, I've heard from community boards, boards, I heard from civic associations, I heard from block associations and a number of other organizations with respect to the fact that they believe that the land use process is not democratic. And it's really critically important that we hear from the ground um, because I believe that the power should come from the ground up as opposed to the top down. In addition to that, um, um, I'm also concerned, obviously, about the fair share doctrine. Uh, and lastly, but not like, and lastly, um, uh, oversight responsibilities of all city agencies, including but not limited to the Office of Public Advocate that should be independent of the Office of the Mayor. Um, the, uh, the budget should be independent, as well as the Office of Public Advocate should have the ability to issue subpoenas and the ability, just like the City Council, um, to initiate litigation. We need standing and we need capacity. This mayor, as you know, has uh, blocked the ability of the Office of Public Advocate as well as the City Council to even issue amicus briefs. And I just think that just goes against uh, all that we stand for, it goes against our values and goes against democracy. We need uh, to have the ability to go into court and seek grievances on behalf of the constituents that we represent. I mean, I think uh, shortcomings of the past are certainly evident. Um, in uh, just 1998, Mayor Giuliani didn't want the Yankee uh, Stadium referendum, so he put on a campaign finance uh, uh, referendum based on his quote-unquote commission. And the, so, you know, some of this was political. And then in 1999, to prevent succession by Mark Green, while Giuliani ran for Senate, um, he put on uh, some kind of a referendum about city spending, which didn't pass. And then in 2001, um, he, he put on, again, coming out of a commission that started in June and ended in September, um, something about um, local laws that could be changed, which did not uh, end up on the ballot. 
Um, uh, Mayor Bloomberg did a couple of commissions, as you know, on nonpartisan elections, which did not um, got defeated. Um, and then uh, also there were some that he put on uh, to block class size referendum um, and to uh, the term limits, which we're rarely familiar with. So the ones that got discussed were not looking at the full uh, city council, uh, full charter. And it's really, it's a, it's a very um, discouraging list if you look at it. It's very um, uh, picky and political and we're looking for something exactly the opposite and I think the only way to do it is to have a commission that is appointed by a variety of people. My understanding in 1989 is it was appointed by Mayor Koch but he stood aside, made no suggestions as to what the agenda and acted as he said as a regular New Yorker citizen and testified at the commission as opposed to making sure that they had a certain agenda. But Mr. No. Charter, um, Mr. Chair, sure, let me just sure. say this. Um, as I stated in my opening, I do not believe the two commissions are in conflict. Um, I, I think one of the downsides that should be taken into consideration, and the mayor should take this into consideration, is the cost of having two commissions. Absolutely. Um, and that is a major issue. Uh, in addition, I don't believe that um, this uh, commission should be rushed. The mayor would like to see his commission come out with recommendations, recommendations that are already predetermined um, for the 2018 um, election. Um, our commission, obviously, we would like to be a little bit more circumspect and it would be come before the commission in 2019. But cost, particularly um, uh, at a time when we are seeing shrinking budgets, at a time when we're not going to get additional resources from Washington, D.C., we should take that into consideration, which is why I'm urging the mayor of the city of New York to reconsider his position. So I'm going to come up with a hashtag. Today, we are better together. Yes. And I believe that that we could accomplish more together than if we do it separately and, and, uh, and appreciate the concert of, of, of your voices coming together and, and, and we're singing with you in the same tune uh, and saying harmony that uh, we could accomplish more together and we are definitely better together in this commission. One of the things that has baffled me is something that you mentioned uh, uh, Madam Public Advocate, is how, how elected officials citywide and borough-wide, for example, being a borough president, being a public advocate, your, your budget is set by the mayor. And that, I don't care who's in that office, you, you're going to be thinking about that. If I speak up, if I say mm -hmm. something, if I make a move, uh, that it's going to have, uh, may have an impact on my future budget to be affected in what the Charter has asked me to do. So that's, that's the point that I, I really, uh, uh, I, as the Chair, would like us uh, to look at uh, very closely to, so they could have the independent powers, uh, so they could balance each other. Uh, and, and being able to do. Well, I mean, that's a good reason why to have the mayor and all the other appointments uh, be part of a discussion because you need the mayor's perspective, then you need the borough presidents and the public advocate and everybody else so that you're having one discussion. That's a perfect example. Let me just say that um, we've been looking at this issue for some time, and well, when I ran for this office, um, uh, obviously that was taken into consideration uh, because in the past, as you know, previous public advocates budgets were um, decreased as a result of their criticism of the mayor of the city of New York. That has not happened during my tenure as public advocate, and I um, appreciate that. Uh, and I hope going forward it does not happen. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I think, um, one, it speaks to the importance of making sure that we have checks and balances and, and that we have independent voices. Two, I think it's also, um, uh, critical that we look at uh, IBO, the Independent Budget Office. Their budget came about as a result of litigation. They sued, and as a result of negotiation, um, their budget is now tied to the budget as a whole, and the mayor's office is no longer uh, provides, is no longer tied to the mayor's office. So I think that should be the model going forward. Our office, the Office of Public Advocate, as well as the borough president, should be tied to some percentage of the budget as a whole, as is IBO. That really should be the model. And last but not least, again, the fact that IBO initiated litigation speaks to my other issue, and that is the ability of this city council, as well as the Office of Public Advocate, to have capacity and to have standing to initiate litigation in the, city, in the courts.
fantastic. I, I'm sitting here baffled. It's been almost 30 years, and we have not been able to do a comprehensive, systematic, right. you know, overview of and, the structures and, and systems because right. we have to structure how we organize in systems, how they interact, how the structure interacts with one another. It's just, you know, and we've been, you know, we've been around for a little while here to understand that this could work a lot better, people expect it to work better, and they deserve better. And I think it's, a, as I indicated in my testimony, this is the time to do it. Because yes, people are out rallying and doing things that are uh, more general in scope, but I think for them to get involved with the nuance of city government, this is actually the time that people can uh, feel a, an, uh, an involvement and would want to participate. Well, let me uh, let uh, pass the baton to uh, my colleagues, uh, Council Member Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, I, uh, I, first of all, I, this is my 75th day here on this job, so uh, I, I do not have the longevity of you, Madam Advocate, and uh, Madam President, you're an institution. Uh, I know you don't like to be called that, but you are an institution. I in love government. it. Okay, well, there you go. Um, the longevity part I have an long issue with. Well, you know, <laughs> I've l less on the long and more on the jevity. Um, I, uh, I, I, before I joined this uh, body a number of years ago, I worked for a borough president who was one of the last borough presidents to serve on the Board of Estimate uh, in the last class. Um, I was not there then, I'm not that old. Um, but, you know, being here only 75 days, perhaps I have a different perspective. Um, my perspective is I have some discomfort uh, with outsourcing my work, if you will, to an unelected body of 15 people. I will not appoint anybody to that board. Nobody on this panel will appoint anybody to that board. And that body will have unfettered access to our ballot to put on whatever it is that they choose. Now, obviously, it's independent, and, but Madam Advocate, you yourself indicated in your testimony that term limits is off the table. I agree with that. It should be. But clearly, the, the commission will come into existence with something being taken off the table. Many things possibly should be taken off the table. Many things possibly should be put on the table. My question is whether or not we would be better served if perhaps instead of putting together a commission of players to be named later uh, that we all vote on and say, yes, let's do this, perhaps we just simply name a commission, don't need a law to do it, uh, that would come back with recommendations. And any member of this body, any of the 51 members of the council, yourself, Madam Advocate, Madam President, yourself and your four colleagues uh, with, with any member of this council can pick and choose what recommendations out of that report make sense and introduce them here in the council. and to the extent that they require referenda in order to enact because some revisions to the charter do, we simply do that. You know, send it up as a local law, have the mayor sign it or veto and we override and put it in front of the people and let them choose. But why outsource our work? We can do that. You can write a bill tomorrow, Madam Advocate. Madam President, you can do the same and bring it in front of the council and let's do the job. So, Council Member, let me just say a couple of things. One, um, I don't believe we're outsourcing your work. I think what we would like to do is review uh, the Constitution of the City of New York, which has not been reviewed in 30 years, and hear from the voices of the general public in all five boroughs. I think that's really critically important. If we were to put forth our um, uh, our issues and give it to an appointee, I think, again, uh, we will be closing the door to uh, the general public and we would not be hearing from the constituents that we serve. And I believe uh, that we should democratize this process and I think um, going forward uh, that the bill that the borough president and I have put forward um, I believe is the proper and appro uh, the, most, the, the, the most efficient and effective and appropriate f um, uh, uh, venue and avenue uh, uh, necessary to do that. Let me also go on uh, to uh, uh, answer a question that was mentioned by the chair, and that is another, I'm just thinking about all of the downsides of uh, having a commission, and that is the voting process as a whole. As you know, we're seeing less and less voter participation, um, and so uh, putting this on the ballot in an off year, 2019, um, when there are no other major elections going forward, I think, uh, I think it's incumbent upon all of us um, and the city council as well as in our respective roles to generate as much interest and excitement uh, about reviewing and revising 
um, our constitution in the city of New York. And the challenge is up to all of us. And I take on that challenge because I believe in voter engagement. I also believe in engaging the general public. And I believe letting individuals know how important it is to, be, to, participate, to, to participate in government. And we are seeing that now, particularly in light of what's happening on the national stage. And more and more individuals want to take an active role in their government. And I think we have an obligation to seize this opportunity. And the commission is the best way to do it. So I think your question is a good one. Um, I'm going to ask Jim Karras to add the state role. But the reason I would like to see the uh, commission that we outlined and go through a uh, city council process is because I think it gives us more weight to put the material on the ballot. And I think people will take it more seriously when all of you vote for it. Uh, obviously, we'd love to have the mayor's participation. Um, but um, let me have Jim answer your question more specifically about the state role. Uh, the state uh, general municipal law sets out three ways to review or revise a city charter by mayoral commission, by commission created uh, by the council, uh, by local law, and um, by petition on uh, public petition, sending the creation of a commission to, to the referendum uh, if you get enough signatures. Uh, it also, it envisions uh, a commission being a more holistic thing. Yes, the council could absolutely pass local laws and as in my years as uh, deputy general counsel uh, at the council, there were local laws put forward that had to be subject to referendum because they altered powers in the charter, but they would each be on a particular subject and not necessarily uh, having looked at the whole thing as a whole. So for example, you could have somebody put in a bill to tie the public advocate's budget to peg it to some thing, but then you would have other elected officials saying, well, what about my budget? And yes, maybe then somebody would put one in for it, but it wouldn't be sort of a holistic review of the charter. But, you know, you know, there are obviously, you know, potential downsides to doing charter revision in any way that you could do charter revision, you know. Uh, I think our, I think the borough president's point of view was that certainly a commission appointed by every independently elected body in the city, including the mayor, the council, the, the borough presidents, uh, would have a lot less of those problems than a commission, for example, appointed solely by the mayor with the staff designated by the mayor studying the city council's powers. Thank you. I, my, my, uh, with respect to what you said, uh, Madam Advocate, uh, and you said it several times that the Charter is our Constitution, and I agree with you, it's our founding document, and, but we seem to have this conversation going on about, you know, opening up the entire document to essentially a wholesale review, and I'm not saying that's necessarily a wrong thing, um, but last year the Constitutional Convention question was put on the ballot uh, by operation of state law, by operation of our Constitution, and I and you, I presume, and many of us on this body, many Democrats across the city, work very hard to beat that uh, for the same reasons that are, in essence, the foundation of what we're doing here, which is that people we don't know, uh, players to be named later, are going to be opening up our entire governing document. They're going to be looking at it, making changes that we don't know. And the same answer, you know, well, it's going to be in front of the voters, and the voters will ultimately choose. But still, we thought it wise to beat it back down. And we didn't just do it in 2017, but I and yourself, Madam Advocate, Madam President, many others worked very hard in 1997 to do exactly the same thing. Because uh, in the view of many, it isn't wise necessarily to open up an entire document to an unfettered review that ultimately has this access to the ballot with questions that may not have been necessarily checked by the elected representatives. I, I too stood with you in, a, in opposition to CONCON. Con. Uh, it was too much of a risk and I understand that. Um, I think because of all of the checks and balances um, uh, that are inherent in this particular process, I believe those concerns um, uh, can be addressed. Uh, and again, I think because the city council, the, borough, the, mayor, all, may, the mayor will have four appointees, the, speaker, the uh, speaker, and I'm sure in consultation with the members will have four appointees. There'll be one appointment from each borough president, one appointee from um, my office, as well as one appointee from the controller of the city of New York. 
um, that will go a long way in addressing some of the concerns that you have. And I understand um, and recognize uh, that it, um, uh, we both opposed uh, the opening up the state constitution because of all of the risk, but I do believe that there are some checks and balances in place here to, uh, uh, to assure us of some confidence that the issues that you're concerned about and that I'm concerned about will be before, uh, be, will be put on the ballot. Yeah, in 1989, I was there, went to a lot of the hearings, and um, there was no opening in the sense of uh, such a discussion that really almost, that would destroy the constitution of the city of New York. It was very, very thoughtful. I too su did not support the constitutional convention. I think the difference there is how those uh, delegates were to be elected, you know, three per Senate district and all those challenges. It's a very different process for this uh, body and I think it's one, as was indicated earlier, that would select, I'm making this up, 12 issues, 13 issues, whatever the number is, and not undo all the good that's in the charter. So I think it's a different process. In 89, it was very exciting. Lots of good came out of it. Public Advocates Office, as an example, and nobody felt that the Constitution was unraveled. And also, Council Member, let me also add, the other fear, um, which is why we both opposed CONCON, was the individuals who were behind CONCON. And so there is no Wizard of Oz um, in this particular process. It's the Manhattan Borough President and it's Letitia James who you both know and you've worked with and who obviously um, are concerned ab about reforming and improving our Constitution to reflect uh, the modern day. Um, you indicated uh, in your testimony, Madam Advocate, you're concerned about voter turnout. I'm concerned about voter turnout as well, and um, I'm one of the very few members in this body who had a contested general election, so bringing out votes and, you know, it's, it's one of those, uh, it's, it's always hard, right? We go back to the voters, we ask them to come vote, we have to make the case. Um, as this is currently scheduled, and uh, you both have acknowledged that this is a reality, um, we're not going to have uh, if, this ballot, if this measure were to be adopted by the council, a, uh, a, a referenda on this year's ballot uh, with regard to this Charter Revision Commission, it would simply be in 2019, which is a very off year, and I use very, it's not just an off year election, it's a very off year election, because not just uh, are there no legislative seats either from the state or the local, but, but for two district attorney races in the city, I believe, and random judicial races around the city, it's an off year. And turnout in this off year, 19, 15, uh, 11, and going back, 2007, is always the worst of the four-year cycle. Because there are some districts that there was literally nothing happening in November. So when we put this on the ballot, what, we're, we're talking to the very, very, very limited group of people who come out in every single election. The majority, the vast majority, and I think we have to acknowledge, because we've been doing this for a while, that no matter what we do, turnout is going to be low on such a question being on the ballot or such a series of questions. And my concern, it goes along with my concern about outsourcing the work of this body to an unelected, an unrepresentative body, and I, I respectfully differ that the body would be representative. It won't be. I don't have an appointee to it. Uh, chairman doesn't have an appointee. Councilman Powers doesn't have an appointee. Councilman Maisel doesn't have an appointee. So uh, I do not believe it's representative of the 51 districts. Uh, one member of this body, one member, one council member has appointees to this body. To, not me, not uh, the other 50. And I believe without question that the five borough presidents will appoint great people. I believe the public advocate will appoint great people. I believe the controller and the mayor and the speaker will all appoint great people. But I know that the 50 of us won't have a voice, won't have our people on the ballot. But going back to the, that was just a statement, not a question. Going back to the turnout <laughs> question. We heard that statement. <laughs> what, how are we going to make sure that the, the, the eight million people who live in this city and who are governed by this document on a day-to-day -day basis have that voice that they come out and that they understand. And I understand it's a year and a half process, yeah. but it's hard work to do that. And I, uh, you know, I like to look at the glass as half full, but I think we also have to be realistic about it. Councilmember, I respect that. First, um, I believe that uh, 
with, re with regards to the city council not being represented, I believe that the speaker, I'm confident that the speaker of this great house uh, will appoint individuals in consultation with all of 51, all 50 members of the city council. I'm confident of that. Two, I'm hopeful that the state legislature will pass legislation um, that will make it easier uh, early voting um, and other reforms in the state of New York, and that will go a long way in increasing voter turnout. Um, and three, we've got our work out, cut out for us. Uh, and so I'm willing to take on that challenge. There's, a, you know me, um, I love meeting people at the subways. I, I love engaging New Yorkers each and every day, and I look forward to trying to increase, uh, to increase voter turnout in 2019. And I will hope to join with you as we go all throughout your district um, and educate individuals about uh, the proposals um, and about the commission and about our work as a whole. I, I just want to add there was a debate 2019, 2020, which of course is a presidential, uh, could get lost in the discussion. So there's an opportunity for us in 2019 to do the hard work and to have these kinds of debates and forums and so on that could really engage people in a way that hasn't existed before. So, I mean, I, I don't want to keep going back to 89, but people really did participate. And there's obviously, there was no internet, there was no social media there. There's a lot more opportunity for that kind of dialogue in different kinds of ways. We have to be creative. So I think it's something that we have, we're up to the challenge. Well, from your lips to you know whose ears. I, I want to thank you, Madam President and uh, Madam Advocate, for your hard work on this. Uh, I know you were greatly involved last year in getting this bill into the council, and uh, I know you're looking forward to this. And these questions, I think, will continue to percolate throughout this process, uh, but I'm very grateful for your advocacy here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and before I give it to Council Mayor Powers, I'll, I'll take just one minute, because okay. I know you, you, you're very eager, and I love that. Uh, but I, I just want to point out that what we have right now is just the mayor uh, making all the appointments. So what we do have here is more of a democratic process. And the other piece to consider is that we have a lot of moving pieces here that are interdependent of one another. I think a commission will enable those uh, to have a very thoughtful and intentional uh, plan that will be reflected in the structure and the system that we have in government. Uh, and so uh, we need to be mindful of that. So with that, let me uh, turn it over to Council Member Powers. Yeah. Thank you for your Thank patience. you, and thank you for being here, and thank you for your, your thoughtful uh, testimony and, and your legislation. Um, I share some of the chairman's uh, comments, so thank you for preempting me there, uh, 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 that I think it could be an insourcing. I think it actually could be an insourcing of, um, I, while you can introduce legislation right now, the opportunity to provide with us together an opportunity to talk about the broad structures of government. So I do certainly understand the the concern about the appointments and not letting the council ever give up its power, and I know you respect that as former council members, so I share the comment, but I actually view it as a pretty thoughtful uh, proposal, both the op-ed that you did on it, the piece of legislation, to insource, I don't know if we outsource, insource, but to, uh, to be at a table together to talk about what our city government looks like. Right. So um, I wanted to ask some questions just about what's possible within the, you know, if we went broader. And I, I would note for the record that I think that technically the Charter Revision Commission that the mayor is proposing could look at things beyond campaign finance. It could. Has been, has been sort of indicated that was the recommendation made, so I think that would be the focus. But um, well, this is for both members having been council members and certainly for the borough president in, in the land use capacity. One of the things that I hear and you hear for sure in Manhattan all the time is the concerns about land use and development and overdevelopment, the role of the community, the role of visibility in the process. And I think there's a, there's a, a hunger for some restructuring around the land use process to make it so it's more community driven. I can't say, I can't speak for every district, but I know in, in Manhattan, uh, question, the daily question is how did that thing get built and wh wh who forgot? Can you give us more recommendations perhaps? I'm not asking you to guide a future Charter Revision Commission, but uh, uh, thoughts on, or and, uh, I, and anybody at the table that matter about how we could restructure 
pieces of the land use process, the ULER process, to uh, make it more inclusive or, or, or modernize it? Well, in the very broadest sense, a pre-planning to ULER process. Because right now, as you know, for the uh, community boards, when the city planning commission gavel hits, then that's the beginning of a timed process. And it is not enough time. So we've tried, you know, with uh, the ULERPs that we've had to deal with to have almost a year in some cases, South Street Seaport, folks in uh, East Harlem and so on, East Midtown, which you know only too well, to have much more time in advance. But it's just random. And so it has no process whatsoever. People just don't have enough time to plan their neighborhoods. And so, again, it would need a lot of thought. It would need a lot of hearings. It would need a lot of coming together with people who have been doing this for a while to figure out what it is that both supports the development community, because we obviously need to keep them involved, and at the same time gives the communities much more input. Obviously, if I had my way, we would uh, not have the tall buildings, and you know, but I'm again, I want other persons to have that kind of input. That land use process needs a lot of discussion, not to mention the budget and all the other topics that we have discussed. But it's, a, it's not, in my opinion, a three month or four month discussion during the summer. It needs more. And so that's what, I mean, that's just one example. Um, there are many others that I think people would come up with, like what exactly is included in the Euler process. We have many discussions about what goes into the scoping document without getting into all the minutia. But these are the kinds of processes that need to be discussed. So, um, Council Member Powers, we really need to balance the interest of uh, developing our city to meet the needs of, uh, you know, to, to meet the, uh, the increased needs of uh, the residents of the city of New York. We recognize that we anticipate a million individuals coming to New York City. We've got to balance that against uh, community needs. And so one of the things, so a couple of things that I would like to look at is community benefits agreements. Um, how to incorporate community benefits agreements. As someone, I've, as you know, who was very much opposed to the Atlantic Yards project, the, the community benefits agreement from Atlantic Yards to Yankee Stadium to other projects, how do you concretize that? Um, how do you make, um, how do you give that teeth, both legally and otherwise? Two, uh, I, since I've been in government, I've yet to see a 197A plan go forward. Can 197A plans, which are community-driven plans from the community board, can they be incorporated into plans uh, which are put forth by developers in the city? And what can we do pre-certification by uh, city planning in the city of New York? Those are some of the issues um, that we really need to look, look, look at um, as part of this commission without bogging down development in the city of New York. But development obviously should take into consideration the needs of the community. And last but not least, we need to look at displacement displacement in the city of New York, it needs to be a factor um, when we uh, put forth land use applications uh, in this city of New York. And the role of BSA, um, uh, most individuals do an end run around city planning and they go straight to, straight to BSA. And then lastly, the Arts Commission. I have argued that we no longer need an Arts Commission, that the Arts Commission should be incorporated into- I like the Arts Commission. I know she does. Uh, <laughs> Turmoil. I know. Uh, I know. See already, but this that's is why great. we have to have this a commission. This is why commission. we need a commission. Um, and so I've had a. I remember when we were rezoning downtown Brooklyn. I remember it was a, it was a several month discussion um, with respect to some development on the color of brick, uh, and that's that's very an important issue. discussion. <laughs> But it, 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 it's, uh, she says it's important. I say it delayed um, some affordable housing. Uh, so those are the types of issues that we should um, have a, um, we should discuss. I, I, I certainly appreciate it. I think we've made the case for our Charter Vision Commission with using the Arts Commission as a, as a potential example. Um, and I would go, I would even say, I think I've heard concerns about what items go into ULERP, what items don't go into ULERP, um, uh, more community participation pre-planning, but also, what is community objections result in in other parts of the process, things like that. You guys both, I uh, thought, mentioned BSA and Arts Commission and other other agencies. Uh, do you either uh, borough presidents or public advocate have appointments to the BSA? No. No. Do, are, uh, 
so so theoretically, without maybe potentially taking away mayoral con, you know control over the BSA or whatever you want to call it, you could also you know, lend. Uh, in a, in a charter review, look at the appointment process for ways that at least the public has more of a, I would say more of a voice via their representatives. The yeah. city, uh, the public advocate's office, we have an appointment on city planning, but we do not have an appointment on, um, in, on uh, BSA, on landmarks. Um, and so uh, obviously, as was mentioned by the borough president, uh, when we should look at appointments in general uh, in all city agencies, and uh, as was mentioned, um, the city council should have advice and counsel on a wide range of uh, appointees, appointments on, in the city of New York. On landmarks, for instance, no appointments, but also no qualifications. So on the LPC, one doesn't have to have the qualifications, and there could be several that might be appropriate for such a commission. Just to give you one example. And, and, and is the recommend or is the suggestion that you should have to have some sort of background around art, architectural or That's the suggestion. preservation? Yes. And you don't currently right now. We don't have an appointment, and they don't have. Oh, to you don't have, have an appointment, but the appointments that are made don't have to have a. Correct. A, 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 it's suggested, but it's not required. No, it's right, not required. Right. I think Department of Buildings has some. Some uh, they maybe changed it a few years ago, often, but they. It's but waived. Often it's waived. Oh, it's waived. waived often. Okay. So there is an opportunity to look at appointments as well. So it's also, I think, an opportunity to look at the council's. Not on your appointment part of this, but in the general appointment process of where the city, where the city council's role, either adding appointments in or where we have, I guess, can, we have to uh, approve certain appointments. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, you, you both are fantastic city council members, and we welcome you back uh, always. And um, um, you both had, I, I, I presume. And, and perhaps, uh, Borough President, you were the, the chair at the point, had voted on campaign finance legislation through the council while you were both council members. And so, and, and what, what years, I, I, excuse me for not knowing the answer off the top of my head, what years did you both become council members? 2002. 2002. 2003. So there's three or, or at least two or three packages of legislation, I think, that campaign finance that came sure. through. The council. So um, I won't ask you to comment on it. I'll make the comment, which is that um, the council obviously plays a role and, and can play a role if we're looking only at campaign finance. In fact, I, I welcome all your support for forthcoming legislation I have exactly on the topic of campaign finance. Um, my comment here is if we're going to do a charter revision commission, I, I, I welcome both increased participate, participation from, from Others that are not currently included in it, I think it's a thoughtful proposal in that regard, and um, and that I certainly support um, looking at our campaign finance system. I think it's always healthy to be looking at our democratic uh, in, you know, in, uh, processes and elections and things like that. Um, but I, I do note that uh, I I would like us. I think it's healthy for us to also take a look at our broader government and whether it's it's working to to its mission and um, and including and being having more participation in that in, the, in that in that process. So um, I, I would note to my colleagues though, I, I totally, and I think we're, we're, we share some of the concern about the council's losing of its power in certain regards or, or precedent. So you have my commitment with colleagues is to make sure that the council and our appointments too is really an inclusive process and that we all have a voice in, in what that process looks like. So um, uh, that's my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, now we have Council Member Alan Marcel, followed by Council Member Carlos Menchaca. Good morning. Good morning. So Good morning. I recall uh, when uh, Mayor Bloomberg uh, decided to cut the budget of your immediate predecessor uh, because of uh, a disagreement over um, what I thought was a person doing her job. But it wasn't just the, uh, the public advocate's budget, it was also the borough president's budget. Uh, because from time to time, um, I know in particular the Brooklyn Borough President's budget had been cut also for the same, uh, basically vindictive reasons, right. uh, retaliatory reasons. So uh, it certainly makes a whole lot of sense to uh, put uh, a fixed percentage. So your council, uh, Borough President, your council anticipated my question, which is, uh, are there legal impediments for introducing a bill now uh, to uh, fix the uh, budgets of the public advocate 
or the borough presidents, in fact. And if there are no legal impediments, why don't we do it? Why do we have to wait for a charter revision? It seems to me something that uh, really needs to be done. I mean, from my perspective, and there are legal uh, reasons to do it, I like to have a process in which the public is really involved and a back and forth. Obviously, um, I was on the city council when the budgets got cut, and I was on budget on the finance, and we reinstated it, so I remember all those kinds of discussions. But from my perspective, I think it could be part of a broader discussion to do with the entire charter, or at least portions of it, so I think then the public has more involvement. That would be my answer, yeah. but I don't know if there are others. So I do know that two of your colleagues has approached me and have um, considered introducing legislation. And I, if my memory serves me correctly, there were some legal impediments um, uh, with respect to uh, council members introducing bills. You, it, also has, a, it has to go to referendum. So the other issue would be, wouldn't you want a larger discussion? Because that does have to go to referendum. Well, it's also, a budget, it's also a budgetary item. I mean, yeah. we, 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 we have a lot of items on the budget that we don't put to a referendum. Uh, it just seems to me such a logical thing to do. I don't know why we need to debate it uh, forever. And there's no guarantee that a charter revision will be successful. True. Uh, since we've had experience with so many that haven't, it seems to me carpe diem, seize the day. Um, I remember how outraged I was when Mayor Bloomberg uh, did what he did. And uh, I hadn't really thought about it until now. And it really is outrageous that if uh, a mayor decides that he wants to be um, vindictive. So I, my attitude is uh, we should do it now. I wish, I'd love to know what those impediments are. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, although the, the Arts Commission is a, a noble institution, it does, however, increase costs significantly. Um, I had a, a, a modular portable bathroom delayed for at least two years in my district because the Arts Commission was upset about some aspects of this modular non-permanent structure. So, and, and as you say about the bricks, like any good thing, sometimes it's too much of a good thing. Um, I, perhaps if the public advocate had a, uh, an appointment on the uh, Arts Commission, we could straighten things out. But we, we do need to, uh, to uh, discuss how to um, make the decisions uh, faster and uh, because again it's every time you uh, delay a project by a year you're increasing the cost of that project i think the figure was about seven percent so with two years it's 14 percent which is kind of ridiculous but finally if you really want to increase the voter turnout and participation in 2019 put term limits on the ballot <laughs> you you will get a massive outpouring of, of uh, voters well, we will, you might also get voted out of office. But <laughs> well, I'm going anyway. I'm, I'm term limited. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just recognize we've been uh, joined uh, by former chair Ben Kellos. Welcome. And at this moment, Carlos Menchaga. Welcome to you both. Uh, and, and welcome to the conversation. This is a really beautiful conversation, I think, and I think there's a lot of leadership that's coming from this council in partnership with you, led by our speaker, Corey Johnson. Uh, and so my, my first question off the bat, I'll start with, um, I'll start with public advocate Tish James. Uh, one of the things that's really beautiful, and we just look at this week alone, young people from all over, I walked with you in Park Slope, uh, hand in hand with some of the young people that had a lot to say about their government. Um, how are we going to include young people in this process as adults? I don't, I don't know if anybody's here younger than 30. Um, how are we going to bring young people into this discussion? That's a great question. Uh, again, the, uh, there are four of the appointees will come from the city council, four from the mayor of the city of New York, and each from, and one from the other um, members on the commission. Uh, I think it's an opportunity we really need to go beyond just the regular suspects. Um, and we need to bring more and more young people into uh, 
uh, into the fold. I think it's really critically important. Uh, again, we saw the number of young people who marched in Park Slope. We saw the number of young people who, who walked out. We look forward to the to the rally that's anticipated in Washington, D.C. on the 24th. I agree with you, Councilmember Menchaca. We need more young people to be involved in civics and to be involved in government. And the challenge for all of us is um, how many appointees um, that we should put to this commission who will be under the age of 21. <laughs> and if there's anybody here younger than 21, can you raise your hand? Nobody younger than you, council member. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you, again, you responded to the vision. So we have the vision set. How? How are we going to do it? And what is your office going to do about it, that? So it's really all about um, participation. The commission requires that we have hearings in each and every borough. It sets the floor and not the ceiling. There's nothing preventing us from doing more. There's nothing preventing us individually from going out and talking to civic associations and community boards, et cetera, precinct councils, whatever, about the commission, about government, um, and about participation. And I think we need to seize upon all of the activity that we are seeing right now in the city of New York, particularly amongst women. And so obviously I want to take advantage of that. And, and, and as soon as uh, this bill is passed, I look forward to working with you as well as with Council Member Yeager, despite his reservation and, and all of the council members, council member powers and the chair um, to again educate individuals about the importance of reviewing our charter and how we can change government to reflect the 21st century, particularly since the borough president, as you know, was the mother of technology. Um, as, as the chair of the Technology Commission, I, look, I remember working with her on a wide range of issues. As she reminded me recently, she was responsible for a lot of the kiosks that we are seeing all over the city of New York. And so we need to involve, um, make sure that technology is a part of this. Um, uh, we need to, again, defend net neutrality, separate and a, uh, issue separate and apart. But again, voter engagement, civic participation is going to be critical to the success of this commission um, and uh, turnout. Something very specific. Obviously, we had young people um, at our office and we marched with them all over the city. We did, you did. Um, the fact that the council and the state legislature passed that young people can be on community boards, and we've done that in Manhattan, and I think you have in Brooklyn. Um, and then the other issue, and that was my original bill, though, was to do something very controversial that didn't happen, which is that young people 16 and 17 be able to vote in municipal elections. I got no support for that, and so I went to the community boards instead. So, but this is the kind of discussion that could take place with a commission that's willing to have those kinds of discussions. Obviously, you could do that with the state. I don't think it can be done at the city level, 16 and 17 year olds to vote in municipal elections. However, the discussion could be part of something that was larger. So that would get attention for young people. Thank you. And, it's a really and, great And point. council member, you know, again, as we stated earlier, the two commissions that are being proposed, there's nothing preventing us from um, incorporating your ideas into the mayor's commission as well since he wants to focus on civic engagement. I think that's also critically important. And they're not in conflict. And so obviously this issue should be discussed at both. We should push the mayor for um, individuals on on younger than the age of 21 on his commission as well as ours. Well said and, and I support I support that vision. Uh, the other the other organiz uh, or the other constituency are immigrants in our community. Uh, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is about to release a report um, that we've asked them to pull together uh, by law um, on just the target and there's some beautiful things that are coming out on that uh, that really kind of show how strong of a backbone they are in our neighborhoods uh, and making them stronger. Uh, can both of you talk a little bit about that and what your vision is as we kind of think about these commissions um, how we engage them, thinking about language access, and just see if there's anything that's inspiring for you in, in, that, in that or with that constituency. So, um, it's so it's important that the commission obviously be inclusive and be reflective of the city of New York. And so we need to include immigrants, we need to include people of color, and we need to include women, and we need to discuss all of the issues obviously impacting their lives. We also need to make sure, as uh, in the Office of Public Advocates, Advocate, we've done a lot with respect to language access. We put forth bills. Uh, we've proposed recommendations to the mayor of the city of New York with respect to 
um, e access for individuals, um, particularly immigrants and those who are um, and those who are coming from Puerto Rico, uh, that we need to extend our arms and do a better job at outreach. And last but not least, particularly as those immigrants uh, um, face the bureaucracy of the Department of Education. It's so critically important, as well as social services. And so I look forward to working with you to ensure um, that language access is not a barrier and or imp impede uh, the number of immigrants who want to participate and who want to be involved in this commission and who want to testify before us with respect to issues um, that are impacting uh, their success in the city of New York. Um, I, I would agree. And just like I suggested with the 16 and 17 year olds, something specific that would in fact get them excited. I would love to find something that was specific for that the community would feel that there would be success at the end of the discussion. So whether it's language access, which is very spotty currently, even though there are bills, maybe the oversight that is done for language capacity is not appropriate. I would be one that would look something to see where is the gap that exists now and whatever. I want something specific as opposed to we should be doing X. So I'd have to see what was needed. I want the vote for 16 and 17 year olds. I will tell you that. That's something that I've been working on for a while. Um, I do think that um, we need to have, uh, you know, this kind of discussion is important so that we keep the focus on government and, and as a whole, you know, rather than one specific uh, discussion and issue. So that's why we're looking. I think you uh, earlier we talked about how we have to make this a whole uh, discussion and the whole, so when you say specific we'd have to see if there was something um, because the community came out and said this is what we need. I think um, Councilmember Menchaker one of the issues that we should discuss is immigrant voting in municipal elections and I think um, that should be a conversation that we should have uh, before the Commission. Look I think all these things are really important to say I think there's a lot of assumptions that we walk into rooms and so these questions are really important for, for both of you as, as kind of leaders with us on this on this project that we say say it and we can kind of hold each other accountable. The, the last question is really a question about participatory democracy and the way that we kind of think about it in participatory budgeting. It's one thing that's kind of manifested here in the city through the city council uh, and, and one of the borough presidents that really offer an opportunity for people to create um, community plans where they can come up with an idea, nine months later, in conversation with city agencies, vote. Middle school students are voting for projects in their schools and in their parks, and that's really cool to watch. The same people that I watched walk in Park Slope and walk out on Wednesday are the same folks that are driving participatory budgeting. They're doing door knocking on the ground. They're understanding campaigns. It's beautiful stuff. It's still voluntary. Not everybody does PB. Wouldn't it be great if we created a component of this discussion? Tell me a little bit about that and, and what, what you think could be a conversation starter with this commission. Again, this commission it does not come to the table with any preconditions. I think all everything needs to be put on the table, um, including participatory budgeting and making it a requirement. As a former city council member, when it was first envisioned, I wanted to see how it um, developed, and I right now am pleasantly pleased and um, would hope that we would move from a voluntary process now to a mandatory process and that it be incorporated in the budget process as a whole. And that's an issue that should be discussed um, as part of this commission as well. I support you on that. I so, agree. Um, earlier we talked a, a lot about what we have instituted, which is pre-planning in the land use process. So before any uh, city planning takes place and the gavel goes down for certification, we have a long process. We did it with the South Street Seaport when I first walked in. We've done it with East Midtown, East Harlem. We're doing it with Inwood, with the council member, and certainly we'll be doing it with NoHo Soho and Chinatown. Everything is a pre-planning process. We even just had a meeting in Manhattan with all of the stakeholders regarding Rikers Island and how will Manhattan uh, deal with that issue in the closing. So it, to me, it's a long discussion before any decisions are even begun to be made. So on the budget process, we should be doing something similar. I don't know exactly what it is. PB is one suggestion and how you get people involved. In our office with the budget process, we do our own. We meet with every council member. We, you know, we talk extensively. It's hard to do a PB because there's already one that's existing. I don't want to 
supersede what the council members are doing, but it's a very inclusive process because uh, we want the schools and the parks and so on uh, to get their fair their discussion and that they feel that there's a, a fair discussion going on. So I think the process needs to be, that's why you have hearings, that's why you have a longer process, a year and a half to make these decisions and not four months. Thank you for that, and that, those are my, my, my questions and, and look forward to working with you. And I'll invite you, uh, Borough President Brewer, to maybe talk to the Borough President in Brooklyn. Uh, what he does is kind of uh, give uh, dollars to, uh, <laughs> you won't talk to him? I talk to him all the time. We talk about health, and what's the other topic? Police. Uh, okay, awesome. Uh, you can maybe talk to him about participatory budgeting. What he does is offer dollars to the members who do uh, participatory budgeting and just kind of amplify it with another $100,000 for everybody who's participating so we can kind of keep going down the line in projects. That's okay. You can do Brooklyn. I'll do Manhattan. As I'm saying, oh, I'm, I wasn't asking for you to give me money to Brooklyn projects. Um, I'm asking you to think about working with your Manhattan, uh, Manhattan we'll Council members. We'll but it, but we'll that we work with the Manhattan Council members. Awesome. But that yeah. really speaks to the issue that it needs to be a uniform system in the exactly. city of New York. And so it's really critically important that we have a discussion with respect to uh, PB um, as we move forward on this commission, as well as other issues. For instance, how each of the five district attorneys handle criminal justice differently. Um, so a lot of these issues obviously need to be discussed, which is why we need to look at our Constitution, um, because it is a changing doc document and it really needs to reflect our values and our priorities as a progressive city. You just triggered an idea about the DAs. So I don't know if you want to wax poetic on that, but I think the DAs uh, recently just made a case about institutionalizing that. But There's anyway, I'm state. glad everything is on the table. Thank you so much for your time and, and go to the people's government. Thank you so much, uh, Council Mayor, for your insightful questions and comments. Uh, Council Mayor Yeager yeah, yeah, wants to make I, a quick I comment. Just, yeah, very quick. We go to um, I just want to apologize to uh, the panel, Madam President, Madam Advocate, and to the members of the public. I have a pre-existing 12 o'clock that I have to leave for, but I am committed to watching the tape of this hearing and listening to every word of every testimony from every person who's here, and I thank you very much for coming out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Council Member Williams, followed by Council Member Powers uh, for the second round. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Public Advocate, Borough President, et al. Um, I have a, a, a number of questions, actually. But I did, uh, Public Advocate was interested. I heard you just say that everything is on the table. And previously, I heard you say that term limits are off the table. So I'm trying to figure out um, which one it is. Everything is on the table except term limits. <laughs> uh, and I, um, you know, I wasn't going to bring it up because I didn't want to consume all the reports, but I, I just found that why do you feel you have the decision to make, you have the authority to make that decision before the commission has been made and before the council is weighed in? So I don't have the authority. I can speak for the Office of Public Advocate, and I believe that the Office of, um, my position is this, is that um, this commission should not um, take on the issue of public, uh, should take on the issue of uh, term limits. I see. You're, uh, you're, you're making that decision based on the Public Advocate's Office. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, I actually, uh, as you know, I, I support um, extending uh, term limits. I think uh, just as you have put in your um, remarks what you think would make your office better, I think the public should hear about what would make this council better. And the way it's set up now, particularly with the council and the mayor up at the same time, I don't think serves the public well. I think there's a very good good government argument to be made. And most of the good government groups actually agree with us. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to take some time to explain that to um, the public so that they don't think it's just a grab. I actually don't know if, uh, I'm actually not sure if I, if I think it should be in this charter or something separate because it, it might consume the entire discussion I, and I don't want that to happen. But it is important to point out that there is a very good reason why uh, the third term should happen. I won't benefit from it because I already have a third term. I'm speaking purely from the ability of this body to do this job independently. I think it, it, it bodes well that it should at least be on the staggered terms um, with the mayor. So I just want to make sure that we, we put that on. So council member, I share your concerns that it would consume, I think it would consume uh, this commission, which is why um, obviously I think we should pass on it. That being said, 
Um, some of the issues that I would like to focus on is revising land use, revising um, oversight for a number of city agencies, revising the appointments uh, for the city council, um, uh, revising fair share, which is a major issue in the city of New York. I also have concerns and have raised them earlier with respect to the fact that the mayor opposes the city council submitting amicus briefs in litigation and the fact that he has opposed uh, the standing and the capacity in the office of public advocate. Um, so uh, I'm not just focused on the Office of Public Advocate. I'm focused on um, revising the charter, which is our constitution, so that it reflects the 21st century and um, that it provides some checks and balances with respect to the office of the mayor. Thank you. I just, again, resubmit to provide those checks and balances because I think um, that third term is critically important and should be discussed with the public. The one thing I agree is that the body should not uh, make the decision because the, the public has weighed in, although they haven't weighed in on the question specifically geared to the council. Um, they've weighed in on a bunch of uh, other questions with everyone combined. I think there is a question that should be asked about the council. Also, for some reason, uh, when, the, when the discussion happened, term limits were synonymous with two terms. We never had a question about what it should be for the body, and so I think those questions should be discussed at some point. I, too, am not sure if this, if this commission is the, is the right one. I want to think about it some more. But I do have some additional questions. Um, so uh, in February 2013, Councilmember Garad and I put out a, a report um, about what we thought should be in a charter change. It had to do with uh, the city budget process. So I just wanted to know if uh, you had agreement with it, and it, it had to do with uh, again, our ability to be a counterbalance to the mayor, and as both of you have been council members, uh, hopefully okay. you will understand. I, do, I don't know if you saw it. I, I did see the report, and I feel strongly that you're correct. I actually think that one of the main aspects of a Charter Revision Commission would be to look at that, and the reason that we want a Charter Revision Commission that's appointed by the council, the mayor, and all the other elected officials is you could have a back and forth. And um, the charter, I mean, the charter doesn't, 1989, there was a big discussion about units of appropriation, which of course is not the public's number one concern. If you say units of appropriation, they probably glaze over. But if they understand that they could then know what is in the other with, you know, $10 million listed and they'd like to know what exactly is in that, you could find ways to break it down so that it was of interest. Absolutely, that could be a main discussion of, uh, of a, of a well-organized representative, the budget in general, yes. Thank you, and, and, and. I echo those sentiments. All right, just for, for clarity, what we, and I'm gonna resubmit to the, to the body what we put out in, in 2013, it just had to do with uh, the mayor's power to estimate uh, revenues yep. uh, and when he has to do it, and, and sometimes he just does it later than he's supposed to. Uh, the mayor's empowerment power, and the ability to impound um, the, the fund of any appropriation. Um, uh, issues with the capital budget, I'm glad to see that this body is actually um, doing some changes with the ch capital, but we had some ideas in, in here as well. Um, and uh, it's critically important for us to, to do our job uh, when we're doing it, and so my hope is that this body will take up some of the issues that we raised uh, back in 2013. Uh, just in closing, the, I don't know if we came up, but I would love to see uh, this body be able to, to, at minimal, be able to provide advice and consent uh, to, you we just speak about, about it, that. We uh, about for, that. For, for commissions in general? Oh, okay. And now. Again, up to the body to discuss, but we gave an example of Landmarks Preservation Commission um, where not only is there no advice and consent, but the members do not have to have any appropriate professional uh, degree or interest in the topic. And what about uh, the police commissioner and the DOE? It would all be person. up to the commission to decide, but we talked about advice consent as a topic for the uh, commission. commission, yes. Um, and uh, lastly, so there's been an idea floated about uh, the police commissioner being an elected position. I just would like to hear if you had ever thought about that, had any ideas. I mean, it wouldn't be something that I would suggest, but um, again, some, to me, when you have these kind of, uh, I know they have it in other cities. I don't know that there's enough um, how you how you politicize a police commissioner? I, I don't know. I'd have concerns about that. I don't have a position. All right. I I, I actually don't have a position. I, I thought it was very interesting, and I just wanted to. There was another idea about having uh, CCRB be elected positions. Any thoughts on that? I think we should look at CCRB. CCRB needs to needs to be reformed. I mean, yes. I mean, I think CCRB needs help, whether they be elected or not. I mean, people don't participate 
Uh, we're going to have enough trouble getting people to participate in the commission, but I think we can. We talked about that in 19, 2019, low turnout. Um, t time is now. People are energized. Hopefully they could be energized. We could support their energy on this topic, city government. But I don't know when you start electing, like I know the um, commissioner of highways in Texas is elected. I don't know how many people participate. So I, I think it has to be looked at carefully. Thank you very much. And, and you, as you may know, in my recent travels, a, a, lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of people do look at, at New York City. So I think it's important uh, to have a lot of these questions uh, answered correctly so that other cities can look at uh, what's happening and perhaps uh, benefit from it as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Council Member. Thank you for your previous work. We're looking forward uh, to disseminating that to other Council Members and uh, to the future Commission. Thank you so much. Council Member Power. Yes. And also I want to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez. Just, just very quickly, I want to offer two comments. One is I, want, I didn't get to congratulate my chair on his first, uh, on his first committee hearing. And uh, I would note that all he did was just take on the topic of restructuring the entire city government as, <laughs> as his mission in the first hearing. So uh, I'm with you. Congratulations on, on that. And um, I just I didn't get a chance to do it at the, en at the end of my testimony, I think, more clearly. But I, I, I think the council should take this up. And I think we should take it up because to the degree we're going to have a charter revision commission in the city of New York this year or soon, I think the idea that we can have full, full representation from the different boroughs and from the citywide elected officials as part of the conversation, certainly the city council as well, in a real appointed role, I think that's, uh, I think that's a proposal that is worth our with our, um, with our taking up, and, um, and second, the broader structures of government to look at um, versus just sort of individual right. targeted pieces of it, I think is uh, more imaginative, and we can use our imagination better uh, than just taking on pieces that are legislated, can be legislated. So I just want to say thank you again for the proposal, and I think it's worth, certainly worth our consideration here. Thank you. And let me say, just say, uh, Councilmember Powers, I think it's important that everyone understand that the state law requires that we look at the uh, charter as a whole and we have violated the, the basic precepts of that law by looking at it in part or based on predetermined considerations. And I think this commission that we are proposing, uh, again, will follow the letter of the law and look at the commission, uh, look at the charter as a whole in its entirety, consistent with the intent of that law. And now I know why your last name is Powers, <laughs> making power statements. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to, yes. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Council Member Danis Rodriguez, and I believe Council Member Williams has a, a second question. Who two of the most progressive who walk the walk in our city? You know, many people call themselves progressive because it's, now it's cool and it's popular to say that you're joining the progressive movement. But we can we know that from from Gail and and this, there's a lot that we can learn uh, on how they have lived their whole life uh, being progressive, like fighting so hard to lift up, especially our working class New Yorkers. And I think that we have a great opportunity, and I don't want to miss this opportunity, which is leaving a legacy to our present and future generation. You know, as a former teacher, or social studies, co founded to school. Mm -hmm. One thing that I have learned that first of all, changes take longer than what we thought when we were a college activist. And that sometimes we have conversation like we are a city of thousands of years and we are a nation in, in, a, in a city of a couple of hundred years. And I think that what you have done in introducing this bill is very important because we need to define the role of each body in our city. And no doubt that we have this opportunity to put this revision to look to all area on how we can have a more powerful government in our city. One particular area that I would like to ask is about how do you feel of expanding the role of community board? 
Because for me, if you, the way how I see, first of all, if not pay as a part-time or providing a real stipend, those members of community board who stay up to 12, 11 p.m., who really know with details our community, they should not be only asked or mandated to give recommendation. I think that we need to expand the role and the influence of community board. Sometimes council member, elected official, you know, we know that we rely on them, but the fact that they only play a role to give recommendation, I think that limits the role. They are the one who knows with details. So how do you think with this process, we should look at expanding the role of community board through our five hours. Well, there are a couple of issues. First of all, thank you for bringing that up because nobody else brought it up earlier, and I appreciate it because, as you know, you and I and others work really hard on the appointments and trying to figure out their roles. A couple of things. Obviously, the land use process needs to be looked at in general. Uh, we talked about pre-planning earlier, how the community boards could have a role in that that would be binding. And the second thing that comes to mind is how they can have a better say over the districts that they quote unquote represent. In other words, they are supposed to have oversight over how Department of Transportation is doing, how is DOB doing in their area, and it's very voluntary, as you suggested. It's not just the land use process that's challenging, but what they say about the data that is going on in their district is not taken seriously. So there are many ways that the uh, information that is given to them could be used in a way that really improves the city services, not just the land use process. So I would um, absolutely say that the issue of community boards in the general sense should be on the agenda of any commission. And the second thing, uh, you weren't here when Councilmember Menchaca brought up young people. It occurs to me, having listened to you just say that, that as part of our year and a half process, we could engage the schools and the high schools in the planning process for a better constitution. So there are so many ways that this process could involve many different people. But the community boards need to be front and center of any discussion, and I said, not just on the land use front, but also on how they oversee their uh, respective noise issues. They're very, very frustrated now, as you know, about how change is made in the neighborhood. They call and call and call and don't feel that that data that they now sit with is used in a way to improve the communities. And you know as well as I, between the SLA and the uh, Department of Environmental Protection and so on. So there's a long list of how the community boards, and they would have ideas about how they could be improved. Of course, they always could use more funding for staff, but that might not come up as a uh, issue of uh, charter more in terms of budget. So just let me, just let me add that uh, community boards are not at a level playing field when, it, when dealing with government and when dealing with developers. And so as was mentioned by the borough president, I think it's really critically important that we provide them with the resources that they need to review uh, land use applications that come before them. Um, they are at a complete disadvantage. Um, and although the law says that they're supposed to have all these professionals um, at their disposal, unfortunately they do not. And so it's really critically important that we examine the role of community boards, that we give them more teeth, that we give them more resources and the services that they um, need in order to examine the land use applications moving forward. And I want to thank you for the compliment, but it should not, uh, I'm obviously, um, I'm sure it's, it's obvious to everyone around this room that uh, 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 progressive politics right now is in the face of a woman. My last question is about extending voting rights. You know, I'm one of those immigrants, about 39% of immigrants born and raised in another country. I think that the number in the 80s was like 15% or less than 20%. Today, in the 2018, it's like 37 or 39% of us born and raised in another country. We are producing the second, the third, the fourth generation, or a grandfather, whoever was born in another country. But New York City is changing every day. And in the past, we, already, we had already a city where individuals who were not your citizen they were able to elect the local representative. We are addressing this conversation through legislation. However, I believe it is important that as we are fighting Donald Trump, who has been an anti-immigrant individual denying 
who we are as a nation, a nation built for and by immigrants, how can New York City, through this revision, also study and look at expanding the participation and the role of immigrants, especially through the voting participation? As was mentioned earlier by Councilmember Manchaca, I believe the Commission should look at immigrants, the uh, extending voting rights to immigrants in municipal elections. Um, this is a commission uh, where everything should be on the table. It's not pre there's no precondition, uh, pre uh, preconditional issues uh, that uh, we are proposing. But one of the issues that we should focus on or look at is obviously uh, immigrants in municipal elections. I mean, one of the reasons that we wish the mayor would work with us and we would have one commission is because when you have the mayor's folks, the council folks, and you know the other elected appointments. This kind of discussion, immigrant rights, voting, language access, and the list goes on and on. We talked about young people voting. Obviously, they're on the community boards. I suggested that they be able to vote 16 and 17 in municipal elections, but this needs to be discussed. So that's the unfortunate part. I mean, I think the mayor's commission, if it goes as uh, predicted, would have some discussion about governance in the broadest sense. Um, but it needs to be more inclusive and look more carefully at the issues that you just described. That's why we would like to have a commission that we have proposed that includes everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez, Councilmember Williams. Thank you very much. Um, one, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez, I can't have you disparaging the orange man. I think he likes immigrants, but usually the ones that come from Norway. So I want to make sure. Uh, we clarified that. Uh, and thank you for, uh, for the uh, second round. So my astute staff uh, found some charter stuff that I worked on way back in 2010, so six months uh, into uh, my term. Uh, and a letter I wrote to the Charter Revision Commission. So I haven't thought about it in a while, so I apologize if some of it may be outdated. But I just wanted to see if you had uh, any thoughts on, uh, looks like an additional four ideas. Uh, one had to do with um, a proposal concerning the use of AMI as a calculating tool for affordable housing, um, changing it so that it's not just dealing with 80% of AMI, but 60% and or 40%. I also wrote what seems necessary is to move to another standard of calculation, such as the self-sufficiency standard that uh, people have been discussing, but I don't know if it's been fully developed. Um, another one had to do with uh, community boards, giving them some additional voting power on the ULERT process and perhaps requiring an urban planning on each community board uh, be funded by the city. Um, and the other two, one was to amend section three of the charter to require the mayor to implement all laws enacted by the city council unless a court has enjoined enforcement of the law. This had to do with uh, city of council versus Bloomberg yeah. way back in, in 2010. Uh, another one I think we talked about was granting the CCRB authority to prosecute substantiated cases instead of the NYPD. Just wanted to get any thoughts on any of those. Well, I mean, all of those issues, uh, uh, community boards just came up, but all of those issues c should and could, in my opinion, be part of the discussion. That's why we need the year and a half, why we need to have more uh, robust appointments. Um, I think in, in different ways, those issues have come up in addition to your budget suggestions. They're all good ones. Um, but they need to have a robust discussion, and uh, that's why we're suggesting this commission. Absolutely. I agree. Okay. And, and I think what's important is also looking at all of the, the cases and decisions that have been decided uh, which curtail the power of the city council. We should re be reviewing that to, to see whether or not um, some of those powers should be incorporated into the charter um, and codified as such. So um, all of the four provisions are, are again, uh, we don't come here with any preconceived um, except for one, except for one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that we should have an open and full discussion uh, with the general public as well. I just want, one, one thing I want to add is that those each one of those topics has a constituency that's interested in it and another way to get people involved because yeah. there was a discussion earlier how do you get people involved you know you and I are involved the people we know because of what's going on nationally are involved but and another reason, in my opinion, to have this commission is there are so many different topics and each one will have people who want to have a say and that will help bolster the uh, involvement leading towards 2019. So topics like that are uh, ones that people want to have a say on and therefore you get more people involved and we could find ways of having immigrants and young people and people who are not normally part of the process. That's what today is all about. Because in 2019, it's, a, it's a, an off election. 
And we've got to generate a lot of excitement with respect to this commission. And I think, as was mentioned, as we bring more issues into the fold, that will be one way to educate the general public and increase voter turnout uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the charter changes as proposed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think the, the, the public in general uh, don't understand um, the, the balance of power that, that exists here, and I think if they did, they would very much support uh, a lot of these charter changes, because things they ask us to do sometimes, sometimes we just don't use the power we have, but sometimes there are powers that we don't have that they're unaware of, so uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, changing that, and in 2019, I'm looking forward to using whatever voice and whatever position I'm in uh, to help uh, push that forward, and thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for the voice that you two have been giving on these issues. Excellent. Thank you so much, Councilmember Williams. I couldn't agree with you more. This there's going to be an education piece uh, to uh, this process. And talking about process, that's the part that I, be honest with you, I care about the most. That we have a democratic process. That there is as much as inclusion as we can have as possible. One of the things that I was impressed with your bill that we had not discussed. Uh, here today is that there's going to be a hearing uh, in each of the boroughs. So each of the boroughs are going to be treated equally. People could come, voice their ideas. That's the, that's the big difference versus somebody, you know, is, uh, our council members coming up with an idea for a bill and say, hey, let's just do this bill separately and let's do another one. If we get to really hear the public in their territory, in their context, and how that could have uh, a citywide uh, impact. And again, I, I'll keep saying it, we, we will be better together. And, and I want to thank you both uh, for being vanguards of democracy. Uh, and it really, it really, really matters. Uh, well, th this bill really, really matters. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. All righty. And with that, uh, let's move with the representative of the Borough President, Thomas Lucania from the Bronx Borough President, uh, Angelina Martinez Rubio from the Queens Borough President's Office, Ice uh, Grodinski uh, from Staten Island Borough President uh, Office, and Ryan Lynch. Uh, from the Office of Brooklyn, Brooklyn Borough President's Office. You may begin as soon as you're ready. Hey, good afternoon already. <laughs> I, I don't think your mic is on. Got it. And you can begin, just there identify yourselves, and yes. then we're ready to roll. Thank you for your patience. So, good morning, Chair Cabrera, and congratulations on your first hearing today. Thank this you. Committee. And members of the committee, I am Angelina Martinez Rubio, General Counsel for Queensborough President Melinda Katz, and I will be reading a statement on behalf of Borough President Katz, who could not be here with us this morning. I am excited for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of Intro 241A that will establish a Charter Revision Commission to draft a new or revised charter. I want to thank the sponsors, Speaker Johnson, Public Advocate James, Borough President Brewer, and Council Member Kalis for the leadership and support in this initiative. I also want to thank Chair Cabrera and the members of the committee and their staff on governmental operations for their oversight and input. As most of you know, I have dedicated most of my career to serving the public. I believe that part of serving the public involves assessing how effectively government responds to the needs of constituents. And in order for government to be effective, it is important that we consider the structure in place that allows government to run. It is hard to believe that it has been almost 30 years since New York City has looked at its charter as a whole, as a whole to see how it is serving New Yorkers. We all know that in the last 30 years, not only has the city changed, but more importantly, thanks to advances in technology, the way in which New Yorkers interact with my office, with the city council, with the mayor, with community boards, and all the agencies and entities covered under the New York City Charter has changed. So I say it is about time we take that closer look at the charter, but not with the intent to make it all new, but rather to make it work better for New York City. We need to look at where we are with the reforms from the 1989 Commission, 
We need to look at our budget and whether portions of it should be carved out independently. We need to look at the oversight and powers of commissioners tasked with providing essential services to New Yorkers. We need to look at how to save taxpayers money by streamlining or eliminating obsolete and more importantly, we need to look at our growth. As borough president of the Great Borough of Queens, I am mindful of the remarkable growth underway here in the city of New York and especially in Queens, its largest borough. Growth is expected to continue, but along with growth will come challenges. Growth in a borough like Queens and a city like New York requires a comprehensive approach that aims to strength, strengthen and uplift entire communities. We need to guide it, to sustain it and make sure we have the infrastructure for our families to age gracefully and for our children to thrive. Community input throughout that growth is vital and it is my hope that through establishing a Charter Revision Commission we can increase the opportunities for direct input from the community on how to best guide future growth in addition to looking at the processes already in place. It is not a secret that in my eight years as council member and chair of the Land Use Committee, and now in my role as borough president, I have always advocated for robust community input in land use projects, and I believe that there are other areas within city government where community <laughs> input should be mandated. In closing, I wanna thank the groups and the members of the public present here today because without their support and guidance on this process, the vision of a new city charter could not happen. I look forward to working with all of you and to hosting the commission at a public hearing in the Great Borough of Queens in the near future. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Chairman Cabrera, my name is Tom Lucania and I'm here this afternoon on behalf of Borough President Diaz in support of Intro 241A, the creation of the People's Charter Revision Commission. It has been almost 30 years since the New York City Charter was reviewed comprehensively by a Charter Revision Commission. In those 30 years, there have been a number of commissions created. However, each had specific agendas and did not address the many new issues that have presented themselves in the 21st century, nor the effects that the Charter Revisions of 1989 have had on the governance of New York City. This commission promises the residents of the City of New York an open, transparent, and democratic process that will involve many individuals and advocacy groups. It will offer residents the opportunity to com comment on what they think their government should look like through public hearings and the effective use of social media. Since it is anticipated that the questions would be placed on the ballot in 2019, the commission will have enough time to do extensive outreach to communities throughout the city, to, to solicit their opinions, and give the commission an opportunity to deliberate and present changes to the charter that would have the greatest positive effect on our city. I am pleased that this commission will give the leadership of each of the boroughs a voice in this process. We at the borough level can provide a unique perspective on the issues which affect our communities and the services that the city provides. I hope that this commission will address such serious issues and concerns as community involvement in the land use review procedure, the transparency of the New York City budget process, the need for police reform, fair share issues, the weakening of borough governments due to the 1980 charter revisions, and the need for independent budgets for citywide, borough officials, and community boards. Over the last 30 years, so much has changed in the way New York City is governed, such as the increased use of technology, the great strides being made in development throughout the city, the ability for people to obtain information instantaneously, and the growing popula population of our city just for starters. All of these issues require us to take a new and bold look at the way our city is governed. This new People's Charter Revision Commission is the best opportunity for the residents of the city through discussion and debate and through the various forms of social media platforms to influence the way our city is governed. I look forward to the speedy approval of Intro 241A and in playing an active role in the discussions on these very important issues through this commission. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Kamara and members of the City Council's Committee on Government Operations. My name is Isaac Gurdetsky, and I'm here to testify on behalf of Staten Island Borough President James Otto in support of Introduction 241, establishing a Charter Revision Commission to draft a new or revised City Charter. The Borough President expresses his regret that he cannot be here in person, uh, but wanted to make sure that it is acknowledged that he it considers charter reform a top priority, and also wanted to make sure that I acknowledge Public Advocate James and Borough President Brewer for supporting this local law, and Speaker Johnson for advancing the overdue effort to comprehensively review the city charter. I will read an abridged third-person version of the testimony submitted to the committee in the interest of time. Uh, the Borough President wholeheartedly believes in the necessity of a top-to-bottom review of the city charter, but submits his support for this bill with some skepticism. He can't forget the night of April 13, 2010, when Staten Island resident after Staten Island resident stood up to address the then in panel Charter Review Commission because they were promised an open process with their vo where their voices were be would be heard. The borough president, then a council member, was too assured that the Charter Review Commission was starting from a blank slate and was going to rely on the input of residents, civic groups, and local elected officials to inform their recommendations on how to reform city government. Unfortunately, we were in for a rude awakening. The borough president does not mince words about the 2010 charter revision. It was a sham. And now here we are, nearly eight years later, presented with another opportunity to enact meaningful reform. And some may wonder if it is a mirage. The difference is that now we have an entirely new slate of leadership with a seemingly earnest desire to undertake real charter reform. And the reality is that reform is so desperately needed that we can't afford to allow any skepticism that we may harbor lead to indifference. Therefore, the borough president is ready and able to actively participate in this iteration of reform, as Speaker Johnson has described it, a broad, comprehensive, and open process without narrowly defined limitations, but feels obliged to offer the following recommendations gleaned from the 2010 hand-waving spectacle. One, top to bottom review. The charge of the Charter Commission must be to comprehensively review the entire charter and with a specific focus of examining the impact of the 1989 charter revision, which essentially gutted borough level governance. An independent uh, commission, the appointed members of the commission must be independent and representative of the entire city. It should also be properly staffed with independent experts. Meaningful public engagement. There should be an effort to work with local elected officials to ensure that residents in each council district are able to participate in an inclusive, robust, and engaging process. Appropriate timeline. The commission should be given a sufficient amount of time to deliberately complete its work free of external political considerations or artificial deadlines. And transparency. This iteration of the Charter Review Commission should be empowered to leverage technology so that it may offer unprecedented transparency into the process in an effort to dispel the perception that this effort, like the one in 2010, is rigged. The borough president looks forward to the prospect of opening the hood to examine the balance of power, the budget process, agency structure and operations, and many other foundational issues that impact the quality of life of 8.5 million residents to make city government more responsive, efficient, and effective. The borough president is ready with a list of proposals that have been growing unaddressed since 2010, like local control and decentralization of select administrative functions, and he hopes to bring that, to a platform, that platform to a commission that will be known as the gold standard for charter reform. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera uh, and members of the Committee on Governmental Relations. My name is Ryan Lynch. I'm the policy director for Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on uh, intro 241A. And a special thanks to Borough President Brewer, Public Advocate James, Speaker Johnson for providing this framework for how to create a more inclusive charter revision process. Uh, and comprehensive uh, revision process at a time when all too often decisions that impact future generations are left to one or two people in a room. Um, the borough president supports intro 241A uh, being heard today for that reason, and he urges the committee, the council, and the mayor to adopt this bill, putting us on a path to a charter review that couldn't come at a more appropriate time. While he echoes the, the comprehensive nature of this approach, he wants to make clear that in this review, that he believes we as a city must take a hard look at our campaign finance laws. Our system is often regarded as one of the best public-private campaign finance models in the country, and while this may be true, it certainly does not mean that it has been a truly effective enough system at eliminating the barriers to entry for those interested in serving their fellow New Yorkers in elected office. New York City should look, be looking to refine its campaign, fine system, campaign finance system, a system that still injects too much private money into our politics and shuts out the voices of those who have the, le who have the least among us. Citywide candidates are much less likely to go door-to-door -door in East New York, one of the poorest census tracts in the United States, 
looking for donations and connecting with residents than they are to be in five-star res restaurants on the Upper East Side. Imagine if residents of Gowanus houses had an e equal opportunity to bend the ear of candidates as those living in Gramercy Park. Do we really think NYCHA would still have a heating crisis? The charter revision must take a fresh look at our public financing system and see where we can learn from other cities that have either fully taken out or severely limited the role of private donations in political fundraising. For example, in November 2015, voters in Seattle, Washington passed a citizen-led initiative known as Honest Election Seattle, which enacted several campaign finance reforms that changed the way campaigns are typically financed for Seattle municipal candidates. According to the program, one major reform allows for the Seattle Ethics and Elections Commission to distribute democracy vouchers to eligible Seattle residents. Other campaign reforms include campaign contribution limits for lobbyists and contractors. Seattle is the first city in the nation to try this type of public campaign finance. Democracy vouchers are a new way for residents to get more involved in their city government, where eligible so Seattle residents receive four $25 paper certificates that they can use to support a candidate running for Seattle City Council or City Attorney. The program set is set to be expanded to include the mayor's race in 2021. Other models to review include those in Arizona, Connecticut, Maine, Minnesota, where full public funding systems attempt to remove money as a determining factor in elections for governor, lieutenant governor, and state legislative offices. The full public funding mechanism generally works at, where a candidate for office, whether state or local, depending on the plan, collects a certain number of donations, usually around $5. These donations do not go directly to the candidate, but rather to a pool of money that helps supplement the funding of a public funding system. After collecting the required number of small donations, the candidate qualifies to receive a set amount of money for the primary if there is one, and another amount for the general election if they win the primary. Public financing alone cannot solve all the problems facing our election system, but it is a start. While the goal of raising the influence of a small donor is laudable, too many people cannot afford to donate at all. Their voices are among those drowned out by massive spending by a small number at the top of the economic ladder. Matching funds do not help climb a ladder that you can't, can't even see. The BP has, the Borough President has called for, and is reiterating again now, for 100% publicly financed campaigns where every candidate has equal footing to express their ideas. Fully publicly financed elections will see more women running for office at a time when representation in the City Council has decreased since our last election, and fully publicly financed campaigns have shown to increase minority participation in elected politics. In short, the Borough President believes it's important we achieve a campaign finance system that one, is fully publicly financed, two, only contributes to candidates through a pool of public funding, rather than direct individual contribution, and three sets contribution maximums at a significantly low level. We urge the upcoming charter revision process to make 100% public financing a reality. It is, in fact, the most important reform he believes this review can pursue. We look forward to the adoption of 241A, and thank you for the, t the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much. Uh, and before I make a quick statement, Councilmember Reynolds. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your testimony today. Uh, it's great to, to, hear, to get feedback as to what exactly we should be looking into as a council if uh, a Charter Revision Commission is opened up or created, um, that we not be stuck with a pre, already preset notions as to what this commission is to do. Um, so I'm excited to see you here. And I actually want to speak to uh, land use. Uh, when I heard this could possibly be happening, I wanted to talk about the outdated land use systems that we have that were put together since the previous Charter Revision Commission was put together, which was in 1969. Um, we have outdated seeker laws um, or seeker requirements and uh, environmental review uh, here in the city of New York that does not accurately um, justify or, or measure exactly the impacts of what, let's say, rezonings are going to be. We also have, have handcuffed the city council into not being able to uh, uh, seriously pursue land use changes without DCP requirement. Um, and DCP uh, kind of playing a stopgap to uh, land use uh, recommendations that could possibly come from the city council when the city council is supposed to assume full authority or at least have the authority to modify land use here in the city council. Uh, we also have a BSA issue where the BSA is, um, has the right to modify uh, land use items without the, uh, um, any, any recommendation or say from the city council as well. Um, and these are things that I just want to, to be able to look at and think we have an opportunity to pay attention to. We also have um, 
communities coming into the city council constantly fighting against rezonings that are happening in their community, not because they're against rezonings, but because they feel that their voices weren't heard throughout the process. We have an opportunity here to modify that ULEP process and allow maybe for uh, more clearer moments of input for the community, uh, maybe before uh, application gets pre-submitted to DCP. Um, so I just don't want to lose sight of the opportunity here to modify land use, so you, the ULIP process, um, as part of the work that we should do with the, um, the Charter of Revision Commission, and that again, we don't allow for anyone to tell us that there's some preset conditions as to what we're going to be doing when this happens. And I, I appreciate the work that is being done by you, um, Chairperson, uh, by uh, uh, Speaker Corey Johnson, um, and of course by a great borough president, Gail Brewer, and our, our public advocate, and really letting the people get an opportunity to state uh, what they want to see changed here in the city of New York, and not just, again, setting conditions before we even start. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify here, Chairperson, and, and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Reynoso, and I share your sentiments. I think that's the key uh, to uh, this democratic process that uh, we don't come with preconceived ideas, uh, but uh, that we have a plethora of ideas that could come in and we could choose um, the best ideas so we could have good government, so we could have, as I mentioned earlier, the structures and the system into place, including what we both have experienced. We've been through that whole uh, land use process, which could be very, very grueling, as uh, those representing the borough president's office uh, know full well. Please convey to every single one of your uh, of your bosses, your your borough presidents, uh, my deep appreciation for their support uh, in this bill. I believe that this. Uh, it's going to be a more democratic process that is going to really engage more people like we have not done since 1989. Thank you so much. Yeah, I want to correct my, it was 1989, not 1969. It's nice to see you all. Yeah, I was just, uh, I was just only four years old then. And uh, I like to say I was only four years old in 89, but in 69. <laughs> So at uh, this moment, we're going to have Douglas Musio from Baruch College, CUNY, uh, Ethan Geringer, Samaf from Citizens Union, Purina Sanchez for Regional Planning Association. You may begin uh, as soon as you're ready. No fear. Whoever would like to go first. Good afternoon. Me. Is your mic on? I'm sorry. Microphone on? In the New York no. region. Should I start over? Yeah, you should I start, should start over, over. Okay. We, we want to know who you are. <laughs> um, hi, good morning. My name is Pierina Sanchez, and I'm the New York Director at Regional Plan Association, an urban planning research and advocacy organization that aims to improve the New York Metro's equity, health, sustainability, and economy. And I am here to support, uh, to testify in support of Intro 241. As has been said, it has been nearly 30 years since the city's charter was last comprehensively reviewed. And the city has changed dramatically. Between 05 and 15, nearly 90% of job and population growth within New York's metro region, the tri-state, happened inside of New York City. That was a complete reversal of the numbers between 1975 and 05. And in the past three decades, our transit system was in crisis, came out of crisis, and has gone back into crisis all over again. All the while, inequality has continued ever upward, wealth concentration for top earners, wage depression for the lowest income earners, and persistent inequities along racial and ethnic lines. All of this change requires 
much more proactive and inclusive planning than the city engages in today. In fact, our land use and governance tools are fractured. There is no overarching public framework driving land use decisions, and it makes it really difficult for us to answer simple questions like, how are neighborhoods chosen to be rezoned? How other communities will contribute to citywide goals of addressing the affordable housing crisis? And do sufficient resources even exist to aid communities in accommodating growth without displacement? Our community boards are under-resourced. Public review, environmental review is time consuming, time consuming, expensive, and worse, just inaccurate, as Council Member Reynoso has mentioned. And last but not least, public review, uh, meaningful public review really excludes stakeholders until it's much too late to affect decisions, especially in low-income communities of color. So the result is that even beneficial projects, great pro projects, they either cost too much or take too long and don't make it to completion. But if they do, uh, we still have the situation that environmental review is pressured to answer questions far beyond the scope that they were intended. We should not have to address displacement in inside of the zoning code, for instance. We should plan for it. And at the neighborhood scale, these inefficiencies come together to deepen inequality, as wealthier neighborhoods are often able to identify resources to navigate complex processes, while low-income communities are less able to affect these outcomes. So with, from our perspective, uh, we have just released the fourth regional plan for the New York Metro, and we, in, within the plan, identified strategies to make planning more inclusive, predictable, and efficient across the region. But I'm here today because we've also worked very closely with uh, Council Member Antonio Reynoso's staff and uh, Manhattan Borough President Brewer's staff to come up with solutions in concert and in, in, uh, in, in collaboration with many, many community organizations and experts on land use across the city, including 10 elected officials in the city and over 40 uh, community-based organizations and think tanks. So the strategies that you have in front of you in your, in your packet, I hope you'll flip through in the, in the future, um, they're oriented around three topics, but the central point is that charter revision is needed to accomplish some of the most important recommendations because planning comprehensively and empowering communities to have more of a say in their own future requires a rethinking of how power is balanced within our city. So we support charter revision, um, and we just have three recommendations for the current bill. First, regarding membership, uh, we, we urge that the appointees to the commission represent a diversity of perspectives and have expertise on a variety of subjects, including land use. Second, we, we hope that uh, outreach will be inclusive, both geographically out in the boroughs, but also partnering with organizations across the city to ensure that we hear from underrepresented voices. And third, regarding scope, won't be a surprise that we hope land use will be a central part of the discussion. Thank you so much for your time and happy to answer any questions. Good afternoon, my name is Douglas Musio. I am a professor of political science at the Austin Mark School of Public and International Affairs at Baruch College CUNY. I wish to thank both uh, public advocate James and Borough President Brewer. I would like to thank the council, Speaker Johnson, and you, Chairman Cabrera, for the opportunity to address one of my professional obsessions, and that is city council revision, you know, you, that don't have a life. My obsession began in 1989 when I co-authored the commission's analysis of the size, function, and powers of the city council and continued through the 2010 commission as an expert witness. Now, the, my, my introductory comments will duplicate much of what we've heard earlier, and then I'll move quickly through that and get to the more substantive area. It appears we may have a dueling charter revision commission, one proposed by the mayor and one by the council. Uh, public advocate James and Manhattan Borough President Brewer first introduced the legislation in December 2017, and it was intro eight, uh, 1830, and they reintroduced it as intro 241 in the new session in early January. Mayor de Blasio, in his February State of the City address, announced the creation of a Charter Revision Commission, charging it with, quote, the mandate to propose a, 
uh, plan for deep public financing of local elections, close quote, and to make changes to the Board of Elections. It would have proposals on the ballot in November 2018 general election, and the mayor would appoint all the members of the commission. First of all, the mayor can't mandate anything to a charter revision commission. Once it's called, it can examine what to study to what to recommend. And in parenthetically, the proposals he mentioned in the speech could more quickly and efficiently be enacted through city legislation by the city council. Uh, putting a commission's recommendation to a November vote would require the final report in August, and as uh, public advocate James and uh, uh, Borough President Brewer uh, have stated, it's simply not enough time. So let's look at the, the comparison of the, the, the two uh, commissions. First of all, the council's approach differs in uh, significant respects. First, it calls for a comprehensive view of the structure and operation of city government. Essentially, it would examine the 1989 charter changes in light of the challenges and opportunities that have arisen in the, near, in the near, nearly 30 years. If it did so, recommendations could be placed on the ballot in November 2019. Second, the commission would be selected by citywide, borough-wide, and local officials through the council, offering a diverse and presumably more representative views on fundamental governmental matters. Of the 15, four appointed by the mayor, four by the council, and one each to the five borough presidents, the controller, the public, and the public advocate. The chairperson would be uh, chosen by the speaker. Now, what I want to focus on is what questions should be addressed by a commission irrespective of its point of origin. Charter revision itself raises two sets of questions, those on process and structure, and secondly, those on possible needed substantive proposals. Among the process and structure questions are, what should be the guiding goals and principles of the commission? What is a good commission and commissioners? What is the desired staffing, budget, and time frame? What has been and ought to be the role of the mayor and his relationship with the institutions and offices of city government? What has been and ought to be the role of the city council and its relationship with institutions and offices of city government. Any meaningful review of today's charter must begin with the 1989 charter changes. What has worked, what hasn't, why, how have the post-1989 commissions attempted to fix it, have they been successful, how do we fix it now, and are any unwanted consequences lurking? A comprehensive charter review will likely, or ought to, be framed by three broad themes, as it did in 1989. Centralized power versus local advice and consent, governmental checks and balances, essentially how to control the power of the mayor, and the expansion of an informed and efficacious electorate. The recommendations. A 2018 charter commission should First of all, and very explicitly, articulate clear and compelling goals. The 2010 commission and earlier commissions never defined its goals. The proposed commissions ought to. The 1986 to 88 Ravage Commission, believing that charters and hence charter changes could reflect clear and compelling goals, adopted a number of goals, quote, to provide logic, rationale, and context for the various decisions to more universal pr principles, close quote. The chair of the su successor 1989 commission, Frederick Schwartz, restated these goals in his initial proposals in April 1989. One, balancing, checking power. Two, increasing participation, adding voices. Three, 
enhancing government efficiency and effectiveness, four, fixing accountability, and five, ensuring fair representation. Without clearly articulated goals, a commission's deliberations are ultimately directionless. It can get you places where you don't and ought not want to be. Neither the preliminary staff report nor the final report of the 2010 commission provided a discussion of any principles that structured the choice of the alternatives and recommendations offered, and that critique is true of the previous commissions. The Citizens Union and the City Council, for example, offered sometimes overlapping and overarching goals to the 2010 commission. The City Council submission stated three goals and objectives. One, greater community participation in the government. Two, more transparency to the work of city government. And three, strengthen the accountability of and in turn the public's confidence in city government. The Citizens Union in its 2010 City Charter Revision recommendation proposed five major objectives. One, ensure checks and balances, two, open elections, three, strengthen accountability, four, protect integrity, five, increase transparency. You must have clearly defined goals. And previous commissions other than the 1989 commissions did not have it, and they resulted in piecemeal ad hoc solutions to problems that were articulated and forced by the mayors. The second thing besides articulating clear and compelling goals is you have to address significant and feasible substantive areas. Significant issues include those mentioned in the 2010 Commission's final report, issues for future consideration, and will subsequently rigorously analyzed in a symposium held at New York Law School in 2013, and the articles in the, uh, the school's law review are an excellent basis for initial discussion. Among the matters that a 2018 commission could address are broadly governmental structure and processes and land use planning and zoning. Just to articulate some of the, the issues on the governmental structure and process, a charter revision should slash must examine, address the powers and purviews of the mayor, the city council, for example, enhance its budgetary roles, make it a full-time body with limits on er in earned outside income, et cetera. The controller giving him the power or her the power to establish or sign off on revenue estimates, the public advocate, the borough president, the community boards. Another area of substantive concern is alternative electoral voting systems, voter participation and the effect, for example, instant runoff voting, ethics, appointments to and purview procedures of the conflict of interest board, oversight of lobbying activities. Uh, another one is procurement, enhanced bidding and contracting oversight by the controller and the, or the council. And then finally, the charter content. Move much of the charter into the administrative code and remove anachronisms like mandating agencies to, to produce their files on floppy disks. This, the, sub, the other substantive area besides governmental structure is land use zoning. And a Charter Revision Commission should consider land use policy since land is one of the principal stakes in the New York political game. Land use policies affect the city and the well-being of its neighborhood and residents. Critics of the status quo particularly the uniform land use review process, see it, see it as inefficient, time consuming, and often wrongheaded, in need of streamlining with shorter time frames for review, and the elimination of steps. Others want enhanced purview and greater powers for the community boards and the city council 
on zoning and land use issues. Two cautions. Beware of unintended consequences. Jimmy Flannery, the uh, Chicago sewer inspector, machine ward healer, sleuth and protagonist of Robert Campbell's crime series, has a warning in the 600-pound gorilla for those who would tinker with the city's government. Quote, a thing like a city government is like a tower built out of matchsticks. It stands so rickety you think one breath will knock it down flat. Somebody decides to fix it. Take out this rotten beam and that rotten brick. Chop out a floor, pump out the basement, add a garden room, and then everybody acts surprised when it comes crashing down, close quote. And then finally, Yogi. Yogi said, quote, if you're going to build a better mousetrap, you better make sure there are mice out there. Uh, I just have one further comment. Uh, there is no specification in the intro that members of the commission must be residents of the city. And I would ask, is this an omission or a conscious policy? And also, there appears to be a duplication of section two, uh, subsection C and D, and section 3D and E, and has to do with uh, lobbyists. And it has the exact wording in the two paragraphs. Um, I am submitting both the uh, written testimony and two reports that I prepared for the 2010 commission, one on the city council and one on the public advocate and borough president. And I thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chair Cabrera and Council Member Reynoso. My name is Ethan Gerinder Samith, and I'm the Public Policy and Program Manager at Citizens Union. Um, Citizens Union is a good government, nonpartisan, and independent uh, watchdog organization. Um, we, our mission is to make democracy work for all New Yorkers, uh, and we believe that that is done through good government processes, transparency, and accountability. Um, We've had significant involvement in past uh, Charter Revision Commissions. In 2010, um, we explored the Charter parallel to the Commission um, extensively uh, and came up with a comprehensive set of over 50 um, detailed recommendations for reform. Um, we're excited to see such interest in reform, again embodied by call, multiple calls for uh, a Charter Revision Commission, um, and we support many of the issues mentioned here today by public advocate uh, James and Manhattan Borough President Brewer um, that could be addressed in the commission, things like land use reform, independent budgeting, police oversight, community govern governance, to name a few. Um, we don't have a particular position on uh, intro 241A, uh, but there are certain aspects of it that we'd like to comment on. Um, as I mentioned, our mission is to make democracy work for all New Yorkers. Um, and to that end, we uh, appreciate and support uh, the diversity in appointing authorities of, of this particular bill. Um, Also to that end, uh, to ensure that the voices of New Yorkers are heard throughout the process and not only embodied in this diversity of appointing authorities, um, we think that uh, there should be proactive transparency in the process. Um, open meetings, proactive engagement of community groups, experts, and other stakeholders, um, and an extensive public education. And that's especially important if uh, referenda are going to be on the ballot in 2019, which will be a very low turnout year. Um, we also have questions about the independence of the commissioners. Um, will they be, uh, are there any limitations on, on what they, on who can be appointed? Um, for instance, can they be appointed from the staff of the appointing authorities um, is a concern. Uh, and, and finally, we just want to point out that although um, the part of the conversation today made it seem as though the, the, the commissions wouldn't be, the mayor's commission and the council's commission wouldn't be 
operating at the same time. We do want to point out that the mayor can, of course, immediately reappoint another commission as soon as, as his is disbanded, and that that would cause um, confusion to voters in the following year and perhaps even conflicting referenda on the ballot. Um, thank you for inviting us to speak today, um, and we welcome any questions you have. Thank you so much. Uh, that was very, very insightful. Uh, I, w I wanted to ask you a question, Professor, regarding uh, the goals. Which goals do you recommend uh, that the Commission should have as we move forward? I, I, I would simply look at the recommendations from the 1989 Charter, uh, the, the Council submission in 2010 and also the Citizens Union because I think generally they are appropriate and applicable and the, the fundamental point is you need some goals. Those goals seem to me to be appropriate but you need goals. You need the focus of goals. That's simple. I, I definitely agree with you. Your purpose without goals. Uh, would uh, it just it provides no guidance and it's so, directionless yeah exactly so if we're going to be intentional about what we need to do uh we definitely need to set some goals and i appreciate your very uh extensive uh, um, report that you just gave us it was it was very good alongside with uh, uh those standing right next to you it was very helpful councilman Reynoso, you have a question yeah. just I guess I'm not making, I don't have any questions because I'm actually excited about how this process is gonna move forward and really getting input from folks more than anything else. Um, I just really wanna put in another plug for Exclusive City, which is a, uh, a document that you should read, Professor, that we've worked together with Gil Brew regarding land use and how outdated the processes are, that our city has changed significantly since 1989 when it comes to land use, and we should be really, really um, look into it. So again, I just really want to push that land use be one of our goals is looking at land use and its role in the city of New York and how we could modify it um, to work better. It's like any machine. It's like a vehicle from the 1989. You have to look and you have to change parts. Maybe there's some wheels need changing. Maybe the engine needs to be, be, be fixed. The transmission might not be working. We can't go into the future with the same outdated laws. And, and we don't want to just look at the air conditioner and the CD player. Right. We want to encompass the whole car. Why not? Um, and have goals. And the goals, I, I want to put it in, just keep using the analogy, it's like, do we want it to go faster? Do, do we want it to be safer? You know, like there's different things that we can set forth um, that are not particular to one item, but speak to what we're trying to achieve as, as a city. Um, so I'm really excited about this process, and I'm so glad that it's, uh, it's something that the city council decided to take on and, and put forth a process that's a lot more collaborative and inclusive than what we heard from our mayor. Um, so again, thank you to all the panelists, Perina and everything, everything that RPA has done to help us push this along. Um, again, thank you all. Thank you for that analogy. I think that was the best analogy uh, we have seen today. Uh, and so we don't wanna have also uh, a, a vehicle that is running on nitro and yet the rest of the parts are not able to hold. So that, that's very good. Um, I did have one more question, and that is, how long do you suggest that the commission uh, should meet? What, how long do you foresee that a workable, efficient, and reasonable commission should meet together uh, in order to be prepared? It, de it, it really depends on the scope of the purview. If it looked at everything discussed today, you probably have a commission in time for the presidential election in 2020 or the mayoral election in uh, 2021. Uh, my sense is that the commission should complete its work by November, by August uh, 2019, but to really look at the important issues that were raised here today and devote sufficient time and to study it, it's going to be an immense project, an immense project. Like the 86 to 88 and 89 charter, it took years. It wasn't, you know, 
three months or 15 months, it was three years. And it produced what you folks apparently want is a comprehensive view of the city charter. Indeed. If I, if I could just add, I mean, the charter is, well, the PDF version, if you download it from the internet, is 340 pages long. Right. And so it's a, it's a quite lengthy document. And to, to think about, you know, if you change one thing, what are the ripple effects down the road? It really does take time. So I think goals will be of utmost importance. I, I hope to see land use on there. Um, but, you know, 2019 is a good time to do it because there won't be the other, the other you know, political noise, if you will, of elections mm -hmm. and, and other, and other goings-on. So this could be something that you know, educates the public in some ways, gets them engaged, and it's a really exciting thing to see on the mm -hmm. agenda, uh, hopefully in 2019. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this was very, very insightful, and uh, my hope is that you continue working uh, with us through the entire process all the way to the finish line. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great day. And the last panel, uh, officially challenged here. So uh, Stanley Fritz for Citizen Action of New York, Barbara Sucker from Women's Cities Club of New York, Alice Carmada from Reinvent Albany, and Susan Lorner from Common Cause. You may begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for having me here today. There we go. Thank you for having me here today. So good afternoon now. My name is Stanley Fritz. I'm the campaigns manager at Citizen Action of New York. Citizen Action is a grassroots member-based organization that's taking on big issues at the center of transforming the society, focusing on issues that work on quality education, racial, social, environmental, and economic justice. I'm here today in support of this effort to examine how structural reforms to our city government can help it best serve its citizens. I want to commend Council Speaker Corey Johnson, Public Advocate Tish James, and of course our dear friend and Citizen Action co-founder, um, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, on the hard work they put into Intro 241 for a Charter Revision Commission. Citizen Action believes that after 30 years, it's about time to again consider these fundamental questions of city governance and supports all efforts, including this proposal, to look into ways to make the next several decades of New York City governance as equitable and progressive as possible. However, we do have a few suggestions. First, we suggest that the Council consider appropriating funds both in 2018, but especially in 2019, for significant public education effort to engage the people of the city in the discussion of charter revisions and to make sure that voters are aware of what they may vote for or against in 2019. When processes like this take place, usually poor, low-income communities of color are left out of the conversation for no other reason but than a lack of an awareness on the process. People in Brownsville, East New York, or the Polo Grounds in Harlem are not thinking about a chartering process, but they should be, and they should have a say in how things go. But they usually aren't as engaged, and they don't have a chance to vote because they're blocked from the process, which is why that funding for education, particularly in 2019, is very important. Second, we have noticed one piece of the draft legislation before you today that we'd encourage you to consider amending. Section 1, subsection C. This section clearly has a noble intent to prevent the Charter Revision Commission from being taken over by lobbyists. We support that intent. However, the language in this section would end up excluding many other people you might ideally want on a commission, including yours truly. That's because the defining excluded category as anyone, excuse me, defining category excludes anyone who has conducted any lobbying activities as defined, as defined by section 3 to 11 of the city code which would mean excluding any staff person at a nonprofit organization who has ever met with their city councilman and requested support for local programs. In fact, it would exclude virtually the entire New York City good government community, including the sorts of advocates who are testifying before you today, as virtually all of us have met with one of you or testified at hearings like this one, and as a result, have filled out the form mandated by the state law that lumps us in with professional lobbyists. So we would encourage you and the committee to please look at amending that language to only exclude people who have lobbied on behalf of for-profit entities 
or to allow individuals who have lobbied to be on a commission if they are first vetted by the City Complex of Interest Board. Once again, thank you very much for having me on here today, and thank you very much for this conversation. Chairman Cabrera, good morning, or good afternoon at this point. I'm Susan Lerner. I'm the Executive Director of Common Cause New York, and I apologize that I do not have written testimony prepared, but I was up in Albany all week. Um, Common Cause is very supportive of the concept of revisiting charter, uh, of revising the charter, of having a thorough look. But we are quite concerned that the city looks terrible with the idea that there would be two charter revision commissions going on. The types of subject matter that have been discussed for both of them are things that we do believe require discussion. We're very supportive of the idea of a very thorough and new look at campaign finance for the city. And we concur and we are part of the group that uh, with the Regional Planning Association, with the suggestion of, uh, of uh, Borough President Gail Brewer and uh, Council Member Reynoso met over a number of months to look at the ULERP and land use process. And we believe, as does the public advocate, that that process desperately needs to be democratized. So the subject matters that are being discussed are absolutely what we think should be addressed. It's the process that concerns us. Um, we really don't want to see New York City, which is supposed to be a progressive city, following the model of Washington, D.C., and allowing important issues to fall into what to the public will look like petty political squabbling. Uh, I know that the council itself doesn't have the ability to force the mayor uh, to come to the table or to require the public advocate and the borough president to find some middle ground. Uh, but I would urge all of the parties involved for the sake of New Yorkers uh, to put aside their political differences and figure out how to do this as one integrated process. I do want to share with you some concerns we have about the bill, um, which is very skeletal. Uh, we've heard a lot of discussion about how it should be an independent committee, a commission, how uh, it should take a thorough look, but the bill itself is really skeletal. Uh, it simply uh, tracks what state law permits the city to do uh, in home rule, uh, section, uh, home rule Law Section 37 and really doesn't give any guidance at all to how people should be appointed, um, what would be done to ensure it would be an independent committee. Uh, there's nothing which would prevent the appointing authorities from filling a commission with their uh, staff uh, if they wanted to, because that's permitted under state law, or to ensure somehow that the staff of the commission is drawn primarily from the offices of the appointing authorities. Uh, I don't expect that all of the appointing authorities would use that, uh, but it's a matter of concern that there really aren't any safeguards. I also question why, uh, if this is to be an independent commission, the uh, chair of the commission is going to be appointed by the council speaker. Uh, if the commission is properly appointed with people who have independence and the necessary experience, then it seems to me that the commission itself ought to be able to figure out who to choose to be their chair. Uh, so that's a matter of concern and I think really uh, somewhat unusual. I think the council is in an excellent position to think through what's needed in terms of guidance and in terms of some better protection for an independent structure since council members don't have the opportunity to appoint anybody to this commission. So uh, I, I would like to see there be a more thorough discussion of what's necessary. I echo um, Stanley's concerns regarding the ability of the public to really participate. And I share some of Doug Musio's concerns in terms of how long this may actually take. Uh, I think it's a wonderful idea to have one uh, meeting, a uh, public hearing in each one of the boroughs, but that's not nearly enough in today's uh, information-laden world. And that raises the last question, which is the bill is very skeletal in terms of how this commission would actually be funded. I think this is going to be an expensive commission if it's done right. I think you're going to have to have 
a robust online presence. I think you're going to have to have different modalities for the public to communicate and participate. And there's really nothing in the bill that ensures that that is actually going to happen. Uh, and so I, I would like to see the bill more thoroughly expanded. I'd like to see the council have more of a direct voice in terms of ensuring that the wonderful statements about what everybody wants this commission to be would actually uh, be realized. The truth of the matter is, at the end of the day, this commission, if indeed it is impaneled, will rise and fall on who is appointed. We need some protections in the bill to protect its independence, but it's ultimately going to be the appointing powers. And so some guidance from the council as to the type of people that they expect to see on the commission would be helpful in that regard. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the New York City Council Governmental Operations Committee. My name is Alex Camarda and I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for reInvent Albany. reInvent Albany advocates for transparent and accountable government in New York and is particularly interested in making city government more transparent. Here in New York City, we were instrumental in passing the city's open data law and subsequent amendments. Thank you for your help with those, Chair Cabrera. And also advocating for open FOIL legislation, which led to the creation of the city's open records platform. The bill before this committee today, uh, in intro number 241A, will establish a charter revision commission to draft a new or revised charter for the city of New York. As you know, Mayor de Blasio, de Blasio is convening a Charter Revision Commission, which intends to put proposals on the ballot this fall. Reinvent Albany previously supported the Mayor's Commission, uh, the Mayor calling a Charter Revision Commission, in part because of the emphasis on campaign finance reform and lobbying transparency, and the historic focus of past Charter Commissions on government accountability issues, for example, in 2010 and 2003. We believe it is in the best interest of the city for the council and the mayor to negotiate and convene one commission to examine the entirety of the city's charter. Council Speaker Johnson has said he hopes the mayor will agree to do this, and so do we. If the mayor and the council proceed with different and competing commissions, a number of scenarios could unfold which could result in conflicting policy, public confusion, excessive politicization, inefficiency, and litigation. For instance, the Mayor's Commission could put measures on the ballot this fall, and the Council Commission could immediately revisit the Charter in 2019, even reversing proposals put forth by the Mayor's Commission and approved by the voters. In another scenario, the Mayor could call a Charter Revision Commission in 2018, and then separately again in 2019, which would seemingly bump off the ballot any referenda submitted by the council convened Charter Revision Commission, and that, in and, a, and that act in and of itself may trigger litigation. It's also possible the work of the two commissions will be complementary, or at least coexisting rather than conflicting. Uh, the events I described earlier may not happen, and the council-initiated commission's work on the charter may proceed in 2019 with different charter revisions altogether than the Mayor's Commission placing referenda on the ballot this year in 2018. The point is that this is an unprecedented, unchartered waters uh, type of situation. Uh, there's no doubt that two commissions convened in the same year would be unprecedented in recent memory and create a high degree of uncertainty. This is why we think it's best that the council and the mayor try to come together to create one commission. And we understand there's been communications in that regard and we would ask that uh, all efforts be made to create one commission. As for the specific provisions of the council's bill, uh, intro 241A, it largely tracks the requirements in the municipal home rule law, article four, part two, section 36. This law gives the council flexibility regarding appointees to the commission. Reinvent Albany believes doing something as important as rewriting the city's charter should include the diverse voices of the city as expressed through their elected officials. We therefore support that intro number 241A includes appointees from all citywide elected officials and the borough presidents. We suggest the chair of the commission be jointly chosen by the mayor and the council speaker 
We think that would be more appealing and fair to the mayor, so the commission would be exactly balanced uh, between the mayor and council, both in the number of appointees and the choosing of the chair. We do support the provisions of the bill that prohibit lobbyists from serving on the commission and requiring the Conflicts of Interest Board to restrict or limit outside activities by consultants who are doing business with the city if they serve on the commission. Uh, acknowledging citizen actions concerns, our read of that provision was that if someone like myself or another good government advocate was to work with the commission, that they would then terminate their lobbying registration and that would enable them to work on the commission. They just could not lobby while simultaneously being on the commission. So it would be interesting to hear the, the council's take on that particular provision given the concerns that were raised. Uh, we also suggest the council amend section 3F of the bill to clarify the commission should follow the freedom of information law, the opens meetings law, which we believe it is required to do so under state law. We think the commission should webcast its hearings and meetings create a website posting and archiving testimony to the commission, minutes of the meetings and hearings, and any reports issued by the commission. We think all of that should be included in section 3F of the bill. We also think importantly that the bill should require commission members and their staffs and any consultants working with the commission to be issued government emails and be required to use them exclusively for the commission's work. Additionally, we recommend the council clarify that lobbying the commission should be reported to the city's clerk's office, as would be required for attempting to influence any other commission. Uh, the city has created a new lobbying database. It only displays lobbying activity back to 2013, so I was unable to look up whether previous lobbying of commissions was reported. But my recollection is in 2010, the city clerk's office made an adjustment to the e-lobbyist platform that enabled those lobbying the commission to report that activity, and we su would suggest they do so again. Uh, thank you, and I welcome any questions you may have. Chairman Cabrera. Yes. I, this is the problem of not having written testimony. It's no, no problem. There were problem. two things that I did want to, to add. Sure. One, the state law does permit the commission to be made up of members who are appointed and members who are directly elected by the voters. And that possibility is something that I would recommend that the council discuss. Uh, because we are to have a really thorough uh, examination and we want to be sure that there is uh, clear representation and public participation. The public being able actually to choose some commission members I think will be uh, something which will appeal to the voters and cause more public attention. Second thing is that I personally I uh, was exiled for too many years in Los Angeles. And I was there when Los Angeles went through exactly this process of having two dueling charter revision commissions. One that was impaneled by the city council, which had elected members, and one which was impaneled by the mayor. It was a political mess. At the end of the day, thank goodness, the two chairs of the commission were able to sit down and come up with a compromise, but after both commissions had finished their work. So the taxpayers had double cost for two commissions uh, and did not have the advantage of a process where the two competing, competing visions were forced to talk to each other throughout the process. So I just wanted to share that personal experience with you. Yeah, and thank you for your concern. And as, as you know, our speaker has reached out to the mayor. We do want to work together. We want it to be as, we want to be as inclusive as possible to have, uh, as it was mentioned uh, uh, earlier, uh, representative views uh, included through the membership of the commission. I agree with you 100% that we all of you that the key uh, to this commission, and it's funny you mention it because we were just talking about it just a bit earlier, uh, that it, the key is who's going to get appointed. You know, everything rises and falls based on leadership. And so we're going to need uh, people who are uh, very well prepared. We're going to definitely look over your recommendations, uh, serious look, uh, your concerns about uh, lobbyists and which lobbyists sh should be allowed, not allowed, or, or what degree. And that's why uh, we felt necessary to have 
uh, this hearing uh, because we did want to hear the concern and I believe that at the end of the day we're going to be able to come up with a better bill and hopefully we could work together. Uh, that's, that was our intention from the very beginning. And as you know, you know, this bill was introduced prior to the mayor's uh, intention. Uh, we, he, he has every right to do so, but I think, uh, and I think this is a consensus that uh, the majority of people will like us to work uh, together for the obvious reasons uh, you have mentioned. So please stay working close uh, with us. Uh, in this process, we're going to need your expertise, uh, uh, your historical knowledge, and, uh, and, and all of the advice that we could get uh, from you. Thank you so much. You. I appreciate uh, all of the advocates, all the elected officials, and the representatives that came here today. And with that, we conclude today's hearing. I want to thank again my staff, uh, the council staff uh, that made uh, this day a productive day. Have a great day.